What is up, hackers and hackettes? How's it going? I'm already gonna start this one off pretty quick here. Uh, I've been already working on a bunch of stuff anyways, so I'm just gonna go right into it. So today's more of just uh, getting some stuff done. So I've been working on some optimization passes, mainly my const propagation, which uh, has kind of fallen behind. Uh, I made a bunch of changes to the aisle today um, that to to an outside observer probably don't seem very serious, but to me, uh, they're pretty massive changes in the, the design and planning of my IL. So uh, today I, so I had a sign extend 32 instruction before. I've actually changed that, uh, the signs, sign extend instruction in my IL to now take an IL word, which is the bit size from one to 63 inclusive. And this now means that you can just sign extend any arbitrary thing. So you can say, I want to sign extended one bit value, or I want to sign extend a 32 bit value or a 63 bit value. And it lets you just kind of pick anything in there. Uh, I also added zero extension support there. Um, but today, a really big change that I made in my IL, which, uh, which is pretty crazy because it was, it was pretty fundamental, is I got rid of a call instruction in my IL. And a call instruction in my IL was basically a special marker for saying uh, this can branch off into this can branch off into another graph. However, it's also possible to resume execution after this call site. And what that means is that on on a call site, I had to flush all of the target registers back into existence, and then on the uh, and then. When I came back from that call, I had to reload everything. So basically, I couldn't, I couldn't optimize any value past a call. So a call instruction basically was like a, just a something in the middle of the graph that would just kill optimization um, across that boundary. And the goal of a call in in that regard is the exact same as uh, normal architecture. It allows massive amounts of code reuse. It allows you to not make a bunch of copies of the same code because you're able to jump into and reuse code. Um, however, I've kind of done away with that. And what that means is that now calls in my IL uh, directly go into, um, calls in my IL now directly go into uh, the call target. Um, obviously, if the call is an indirect call, it's an, uh, an indirect branch, and that's the end of a end of a graph. But in this case, let's take a look at um, the six five zero two that we're lifting. And why why have I made this change? It it basically makes optimizations so much easier because I no longer have to like now I know that everything in the graph is always sane, and I can optimize anything across any boundary. Uh, as long as it's like a dominator, uh, post-dominator relationship. Um, whereas before, I had to basically look through and see, is there a call anywhere in here? And if there is a call, then I need to potentially not allow re-execution. And then if something needs to jump back to start in the middle of a graph, it needs to have a way of like jumping to that location. So I'm sure calls will show up eventually later. Um, but for now, I've, I've temporarily removed them. And as I'm saying that, I'm like thinking, ah, do I really want them or not? But this actually is going to line up a lot with some uh, future optimization passes that I plan on implementing um, that code duplication will actually help for those optimization passes. And I don't really care about memory usage here. I don't care if this JIT uses 512 gigs of RAM. I don't give two shits. Now, that would affect perf because now you're going to have iCache thrashing and less reuse of the iCache. But at the end of the day, that's likely not going to outweigh the benefit that I'll get from some of the crazy optimizations I'm going to get to do. So if we take a look at these instructions, uh, and I think in graph mode, there's a way to turn on... Um, is there a way to put the addresses in graph view? Line prefixes? Okay, there is. Um, so here we have kind of the instructions that we're going through, and I did make those default on this IDA. Um, so here we're like going through, we're chugging along, we do like uh, if this foo instruction is just a CLD, so it's just zeroing out that direction flag register. And then next we have a foo one, 
Uh, this is loading a zero into the X register. And why, why is that doing that? Um, did I lose an instruction start marker? That's, that's storing zero into target one, which is great. But what's going on here? What are, what are these? 38.3F. That's getting a zero and putting in a target. Oh, this is, uh, this is flag computation. Whew. I was about to say like, what is going on? Um, it's the flag computation. So this is, this is computing the, um, this is doing a, a sign extension of that top bit. Um, to basically get the, this is getting the, the, the negative flag. And then here there's getting the zero flag. So, uh, what I'm working on right now is I'm working on some constant propagation passes. Um, oh, I'll show you the call. Sorry. I'm getting distracted. Um, so here we have F 9 and instead of actually implementing a call instruction, it's going to update the stack. All the memory operations are going to remain the same, but we see that the next instruction it executes is F O one F. And that means that this, uh, this graph actually is going to get inlined. So any call is going to get inlined into this graph. And I know that that's going to have massive, massive memory uh, usage penalties, but I, I don't care. Um, <laughs> there's, there's some really cool things that the more that I can, the bigger my graph, the more optimizations I can do. Um, it, it's basically the same reason that uh, um, uh, LTO exists. The same reason you have the link time optimization where it basically puts all of the functions in one code gen unit and then optimizes the whole thing as a blob. And obviously I can easily add thresholds on this and I can say, don't inline up to a certain level of nesting or don't inline a certain amount of blocks like that I can do later. Um, but I'm not really worried about that really even being an issue in the future. Um, obviously if there's infinite recursion, that's an issue. So I'll have to eventually add a cap when I see some recursion stuff, but That'll come at a later date, so uh, I'm not too worried about that right now. So the one thing that I'm looking at right now that I want to fix is my constant propagation. And uh, before I started the stream, I actually just implemented zero extend and sign extend and XOR, um, XOR, which apparently is not in here, uh, XOR. Um, and basically, this is implementing, so the way the constant propagation works, it's actually really simple, um, as is pretty much any optimization pass on, uh, on an SSA form IL. So in this case, I'm going to get the flow graph. I'm going to use this flow graph to basically get all the nodes in here. So it's going to start at block zero, and it's going to walk the graph, and that's going to find all the active blocks in the graph. Um, so we're going to generate that flow graph. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through every single node in the flow graph. Um, and is this not including blocks here? I think it, it does include blocks here. Let me take a look. Uh, that's in folk IL source IL graph uh, walk or traverse. And uh, flow, oops. So flow graph two, this gets created. I forget who actually creates that, but that's going to be the flow graph two, and we got flow graph from. Ah, uh, flow graph two. Does this include the this the root node? And it does, because this is going to end up returning out this hash map, and the hash map is the flow graph, and the flow graph uh, will update. Um, oh, maybe it won't include the root node. I need to double check that. Um, I know that I made this one like optionally be able to include that. And this one, flow graph two, are these only the nodes that we can go to? If, if that's the case, we just need to change this to something else. Let me see who would update this flow graph two. Let me take a look at the code here. Someone updates this. Oops. RG 
uh, self dot this dot start equals. Okay, it looks like I'll graph mod RS. Okay. Uh, self dot this. Okay, that's gonna get the flow graph to directly and the flow graph from. Oh, interesting. Um, let me just take a look at it. I'm just I'm just gonna print it out. Um, I could reason about the code, but I'd rather just print and then I would know. Uh, where are we at right now? We're in this one. Const prop. So there's a chance that I'm not doing any constant propagation on the the root, the like initial node, uh, for node in this. I feel like that's probably not the case, but we'll see. This is gonna be really spewy. We only care about the last one. Come on. Okay, and this has uh, 25, 24, 8, 4. It does have the zeroth node. And how did it get in there? So, um, if it's finished, we get the targets. We insert the node itself and then all the targets. Okay, so, it, yeah, it will always include itself. Whew! Had me sweating. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to traverse every single node in the graph which are linked up, we'll, if there's an unlinked node in the graph, which I do support, it allows, it allows some nice optimizations to like, be able to fragment and drop a node in the graph. So this will traverse all of the active nodes. And then uh, I will see is, um, I'm gonna go through each node in the graph and then each instruction in that node, uh, node is like a block, I, I call them nodes. Um, so in this case, we're gonna go through like block zero and we're gonna go through all the instructions. And I'm gonna say, if the instruction is an immediate instruction, we're gonna get the output register. So basically in this case, this instruction one, this is an immediate load into ILR zero. So this outreg would be ILR zero and then this value would be zero. So then what I do is I update this uh, temporary um, constant database. And I say that this output register is created, um, or this output register holds a constant value, and the value is this. Uh, and then I make sure that there's only one matching output register because it's impossible to ever have two. Um, that would be a violation of SSA. So this database basically tells me this aisle reg holds a constant value. That means down here, when I go through, I so I kind of create that database once by going through all the nodes, and then I go through all the nodes again, so in this case, uh, go through all the nodes again, go through each instruction in the node. Okay, so here I'm going through each instruction and then uh, let's look at, so then I do a match on the instruction and I like determine the type of instruction. And let's look at, at these cases. So these all have the same form, the add sub, and or XOR, shift left, shift right, and shift arithmetic right, they all have the same form. They take an X value and then another value, and then they output to an IL register. So I concretize, or I, I unreference the, um, the result here. And then what I do is I say, if both the X value and the Y value are both resolvable. So basically I, I look them up failably in the database for each one, and then if, both of them resolve to some immediate value, that means they're constants. And so what I do is I say, I match on the instruction type and then I perform the operation. So an add, I do a wrapping sub X wrapping, or wrapping add at Y, a sub wrapping sub Y, an and is just X and Y or X or Y, X or X, X or Y, then shift left. It looks kind of complicated, but basically uh, if I look at checked uh, shift left in Rust, I think this takes a U8 or something. What does this take? Uh, it takes a U32. Um, and since that takes a U32 and we have a U size potentially being used as the shift amount, uh, what I do is I do a try into, and basically if the conversion fails, then I'll hard code it to 1024 as the shift amount. And then we'll perform the shift. And what Rust does is in this case, in a, in a checked shift left, um, if, RHS, if the right-hand side is 
larger than or equal to the number of bits. Basically, it's going to shift away the entire contents. Um, then that's going to give us kind of this result. So that will cause a none value. So what I say is unwrap that or zero. Because in my IL, I've defined that shifts of a value larger than the bit size result in a zero for both the uh, logical shifts and then for the arithmetic shifts, um, it will always be the sign extended or, or zeroed version. So that's why this uh, shift left looks like this and the shift right looks like this. And then here's the shift arithmetic right. We take the, the Y value, we then cap it to 63. So that means if you're trying to shift arithmetic right by 1,000, it will get capped to 63, which we know will always fit um, for the shift amounts, which is fine. And basically, what that means is even if you shift by 1,000, the top bit is still going to remain there, which is fine because the top bit is what's getting extended anyways. So it's either a 0 or a 1, and that's going to end up in the 0th position and everything sign extended. So we take X, we convert it to an I size, and then we right shift it. Um, so now it's doing an arithmetic shift based on the fact that this is a signed value. Uh, we perform the shift, and then we get the U size. And now we have computed um, all of these. So what I want to do is I want to quickly look at um, all of my IL instructions. So here are all the different IL instructions I implement. I have instruction start, which is just a marker. There's no way that we optimize that out. It's just it's only a marker. In the case of a JIT, it results in no code. It's just it's only there to mark in the stream. Immediates, obviously we can't optimize an immediate um, in for constant propagation. Register reads and writes, we can't constant propagate because they're not constants. All the memory reads and writes, we can't. So then we have, that leaves us with a couple more. We have, um, we have add, sub, and or XOR. Uh, let's see, add, sub, and or XOR. And then we should also handle down here, add, sub, and or XOR. And then we'll have shift left, shift right, shift arithmetic. One, two, three. One, two, three. I'm just double checking. Uh, the multiplies we don't constant propagate right now, but we haven't implemented these multiplies. In fact, I probably should remove them until we go to implement these. Then I have a zero extension, which I just implemented. I just added those. They're actually new IL instructions. So here is how I implement that, is if the instruction type is a zero extend or a sign extend, we're going to get the resulting IL register. So this is like the output. Then we're going to get the value that it's trying to shift, or the IL register that it's trying to shift on. And then the bit size is a, is a constant in the IL. So I make sure that the bit size follows the rule, because that is a rule in our IL. We actually enforce this more prettily, so I don't have a message here. And that's because when I go to, um, when I go to actually perform uh, a, what is it, a uh, sign extend, I actually do the checks here. So there's no way that those could end up in the graph unless they were incorrectly implemented anyways. But I still like to assert in multiple places just in case I get creative with some optimization things in the future. Um, I think it's important to always reassert things. An assertion costs nothing. It's so, it's so cheap. Just, just put them in your code. Even in internal places where you quote unquote, know that it won't be the case. Just fucking put it there. It's free. It's free. It's not technically free, but it's, it's so cheap. So what I do is I take uh, the bit size amount, I compute the shift amount. So I take 64, I subtract the bit size. So this will give me the amount to shift by. And then if the value is a concrete value, it, basically if it's a constant value, then I will zero extend by taking the value, shifting it to the left by the shift amount, and then shifting it to the right by the shift amount. So if we imagine that this is eight bits, if, if we say we want to do an eight bit sign extension, the shift amount will be 56, we'll end up shifting up all the way over. So like if we were to pop up calc, right? And we've got FF here. If we were to left shift this by 56, we now see that the, the FF is at the very top and then if we go back to shift that over, this is actually going to sign extend. Um, now we have all Fs because we have the, the original bytes here. In fact, a better demonstration would be 80 hex. If we left shift this by 56 and then right shift it by 56, we'll see that we have 
a sine extended value with 80 here. So the logic for zero extend is the same. This is just shifting in zeros on this right shift because it's a logical shift. And then in this case, we convert the value to an unsigned or to a signed value, which then means that this shift will actually be an arithmetic shift. So now we have constant propagation on these uh, signing zero extension. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to comment these out temporarily and just kind of show you what effect that has. So we'll open up a, another, we'll duplicate this tab once this is done running. Okay. And let's see if we can view these side by side. And I don't know if anything in this graph will be affected by this. Um, I'm guessing there will be things. So there's 20, there's 28 in that block. In this block, there's 76, 76, uh, 13, 47. Okay, that might not have had an effect on any of these blocks, really? Let me uh, refresh this. I thought I saw one. Uh, yeah, like here we have a zero extension. So what happens here? So if we look at, this is block eight. So at block eight, I want to take a look at this right here, 25. So at 25, oh yeah. Um, it did get optimized down. Okay, I didn't refresh or something. So what we see here is if I go to, uh, which one was it? This one right here. If I go to FO23, the FO23 instruction. So previously, this would load a, a immediate value into ILR63. And then it would zero extend that uh, with... 8 bits, it would be a 0 bit, or an 8 eight bit value that gets 0 extended to the full 64 bit size. And that's a constant, right? So ILR64, so what gets loaded into this target is a constant. So in this case, if we look here, we see that target 0 gets assigned ILR47. And if we look at ILR47, ILR47 is actually created way sooner in execution, and it's an FO. And that makes sense, because ILR63... Uh, when we zero extend that as an 8-bit value, it becomes F0. And then another optimization pass picked up that we already had a similar constant already loaded into an IL register, and thus it just grabbed it directly from there. So that was a really, really cool way of basically causing that uh, value to get um, that value to get optimized out, and that reduced one uh, instruction in our IL stream, and, and probably a couple more if we look around. So it got rid of two instructions there. Uh, it got rid of probably not too many. It's, a, it's kind of an edge case, uh, but we're going we're gonna to do a lot of reduction on this code as we, as we write stuff today. So, uh, and I got rid of another one here. So that got rid of three instructions. One of these got uh, removed. So one of these was a zero extended constant, this one right here, ILR2, which is a, a zero extension of zero. And we'll see that ILR2 is now gone, doesn't exist anymore, and it just gets ILR0 directly, which is really cool. So that's kind of the effect there. Had a seg fault, yep, that's, a, that's fine, not a big problem. Okay, so, okay. Now I'll just run it again. This will put it back into the, the mode that we implemented and everything will be fine. So what's cool is that we're gonna get to see that one of these in the very first block, um, we don't have constant propagation for yet. And in this case, it's saying if ILR0 is equal to ILR0, then it should be uh, set to not zero, otherwise zero. So this is completely pointless. <laughs> Right? This is something that can get propagated out. And this is a relatively expensive computation in the, um, in the JIT itself. This would, this would probably become like three or four x86 instructions. So if I'm not mistaken, branch conditional, all the branches we can't optimize out. Traps, no reason to optimize those out. Um, so I think the only one we don't have implementations of is set, uh, set conditional. So we're going to implement constant propagation for that one. Let's take a look. So this is ILINST 
set conditional, and this takes in a result, an x value, a condition, and a y value. And we'll kind of copy some of this code here that we have. Uh, we're going to do basically the same thing as down here. Doop, doop, doop. So if x and y can be resolved, then we're going to do stuff in here. Oh, and the, and the way that this effectively works is I'll compute this constant value, and then I'll replace the instruction that's in the instruction stream, the one in this case a zero extension or a sign extension, I replace that instruction entirely with just an immediate load of the result value because that's the net effect of that instruction. And then I set this constant propagated flag to true, uh, which gets returned out and that causes the, it causes everything to get looped over again. Okay. So what's really cool about this is we don't actually remove any instructions. That's done in another optimization pass. So we don't have to worry about the graph changing shape while we're in this optimization pass. So that's one thing that's really important is to kind of keep these things modular and doing a simple task. You don't want to do multiple optimization passes in one function. That would, that would just be a mess. So in this case, we know we're in a set condition uh, set conditional, and uh, both x and y are concrete. So I'm actually going to borrow code from the emulator. Uh, let's see. Uh, set cond. Looks like I do have this. Looks good. Okay, so here are all of the conditional codes. So we're going to match on those. Oops. And what we're going to do is we're going to say the result, or the, like, condition result. So, and I know these names are a little bit long, but it's just, it's just meant to be clean. It's meant, it's meant to be, like, very explicit. I'm trying not to use many acronyms or, or um, uh, like, I don't know, a good... Uh, mnemonics or something for these. I'd rather just type them entirely out and it's fine. Uh, it makes it a lot more readable so you understand what's going on. So in this case, uh, we're just going to say if x is equal to y, okay, if x is not equal to y, okay, and then we have a signed version. So I'm going to make a let signed x is equal to x as i size and let signed y is y as i size. So um, create signed versions of the values to make for simpler code. So a signed less than, simple. We're going to do signed x is less than signed y. Oops. Then we have a signed less than or equal. Signed x is less than or equal to signed y. Probably need some commas in here. And then the unsigned less than is just x less than y. And the unsigned less than or equal, y. So now we have uh, compute the result of the condition, uh, of the conditional. And then the way that this instruction works, the, it results in all Fs if it's true and zero if it's false. So what we'll do is we'll say if cond result, then, so this is going to be the actual result, and we're just going to grab this here. This code is what we're effectively going to want to do. I'm going to say, let the result value is equal to, if the condition result, then that, otherwise, zero. And we might be able to fit this in one line. Oh, yeah. So then compute the actual, um, uh, actual constant value for the result. So if the conditional result... If it was true, then it's a not zero, which is all Fs. That, that's the same in, in C as a, it's a once complement. So uh, set all Fs if it's true, otherwise it's zero, and then we replace the instruction that we're in with a immediate uh, load of that value. So in this case, we see if ILR0 is equal to ILR0, always true, then we load a not zero, and that goes into target six. So now when we run this code, Do, do, do. Man, the build times are getting long. 
Now we should not see that. Yeah, that conditional uh, operation has gone away. And now we just see that target eight is directly slammed into target, or ILR eight is directly slammed into target six. So we've removed a couple instructions there. In fact, this block, I think this block we removed, I think it was at 76. Um, so we're going to comment this out, uh, set conditional and the zero extend. We're going to build this quick, build and run it. And then we're going to make a copy of this. And this will be like the pre-stream uh, code state. This will show what the aisle looks like prior to this stream. So we'll make a copy of graph.png to, uh, we're going to call this uh, pre-stream graph.png. OK. And I just need to make sure that I don't run that again. I'm just going to put some trash in my history, as one does, right? I don't know if there's a good way. I know in uh, the Windows terminal, you can Alt F7 to clear your history. And I do that a lot. Like, I'll do that after, like, a git push or a git commit. And that prevents me from up arrowing that message again. There's probably a similar way on Linux. Or I guess that's going to be shell dependent. So bash. OK, so let's see what we had pre-stream. So pre-stream, we had 242 instructions. Now we have 232. So we removed 10 instructions. And if we do the math on that, uh, uh, come on, come on, 10 over 242, that was a 4.1% reduction in IL instructions in our graph by implementing, what was this? Uh, 57 lines of code and a lot of it was copy pasted so it like wasn't even that much work so it took 10 minutes to remove um to end up removing 4.1 percent of the instructions in the il stream and remember that doesn't have any effect on the behavior of the application it just reduces the amount of stuff that we have to jit it reduces the amount of um overhead of those things so the next optimization pass that we're going to implement is one that I've been putting off because it's a little bit difficult. It has a couple a couple caveats that are scary. So that's why I got rid of the call instruction because it makes it a little easier. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to uh, propagate uh, target stores and loads. And that's going to be a huge improvement, especially on any flagged architecture, which 6502 is. So if we take a look here, we have a computation of these flags. And we set target 11 to these flags. And we set target 6 to, to this flag. And then on the next instruction, we probably also set, yeah, target 11 and target 6 get overwritten again. And those target uh, register writes in my JIT will actually write to memory. So this is, this is a memory write, and this is a memory write. And also, um, we loaded an immediate such that we could load up this target six, even though we end up never using target six until we write over it. So what we want to do is we want to basically on register reads, we want to say that that IL register now contains the most recent copy of um, a target register. And then when we have a... Uh, and then when we have a write to a target register, we want it to actually only um, update where that target register lives, like what IL instruction, quote unquote, owns that uh, IL register. Now we need to accumulate that information such that at the end of the graph, or basically any any block that has no re-entry, um, at the end of like here when we branch indirect, so this is like a ret target. If we if we look at uh, FO4B, it's probably a ret instruction. Uh, let's take a look. FO4B. Yep, this is the return of this function. So in the case of this return path, uh, obviously right now everything's fine because we're always flushing out those target registers. But in this case, when we write this optimization pass, we need to make sure that the target registers are all flushed out. So any target register that's being quote-unquote tracked in an IL register needs to get flushed out uh, to its target register. So the way that I kind of plan on writing this, and I actually don't have, um, 
I don't actually have uh, register spilling in my IL. And right now, by loading and storing the target registers every single time like this, this means that the spilling will pretty much never be an issue. I could eventually accumulate enough constants where spilling would be an issue. Um, but effectively, what I, what I want to do is we're just going to ignore spilling for today. Um, there's a chance that this optimization pass will then cause so many IL uh, registers to be live. So right now, an IL register is live if it is accessed at any point after its creation. And um, an IL register, in this case, IL registers always stay alive when we're looking at the IL itself. When we're looking at this graph, they always stay alive. But in terms of register allocation, we actually can detect that at this point, let's say like, it's not true, but let's say like at this point, uh, uh, this instruction number eight on block four, we could say, okay, ILR zero is no longer used at this point. And then I would, in my register allocator, I can go and reuse whatever register I allocated to hold the value uh, zero. So like when this instruction executes, I have to find some free register on the system uh, out of the like basically 26 or 27 registers that I, I put up for allocation. In fact, that is in JIT. Um, so here's my al register allocation block. So this is saying these are all of the registers that can be dynamically used in every single graph. Uh, from the start of the graph, all of these are, are available. So I don't have any calling convention that preserves any of these between graphs. At the start of every single graph, all of these are up for use. And at the end of each graph, all of them are flushed out or no longer used ever again until a, another graph goes through and reinitializes them. So now what can get difficult is that when you have, when I get rid of these target loads and stores, that means that uh, a lot of these IL registers are going to quote unquote live for a lot longer because in this case, uh, ILR zero is kind of a bad example, but if I found like a unique constant, let's say like one, even though it's not a unique constant and this one, uh, that's not a good example. Come on. Uh, here's a good example. So this 9a, we load hex 9a, and then we store that in target register zero. And I would suspect, I can't actually search this graph, but I would suspect that um, this 9a value is probably never used again in this function, unless there's a loop. Um, and if that's the case, that means this register, this ILR75 register allocation can get freed forever. However, when I... When I write some of these optimization passes that we're about to write, this will no longer be written to a target register, which means it's no longer like sunk. The lifetime is uh, basically the scope of this is kind of deleted. It, this is its final use once it's stored in this target zero. Um, so lifetimes of IL registers might start to expand more and more and more as we write some of these optimization passes, which means we might exceed uh, the amount of registers that we have available, which then means I have to implement register spilling, which is going to be like a whole day of work. Even though it's it's not that complex of an algorithm, doing it efficiently and in a way that your code is still written in a clean way, because then once I start spilling things, I will potentially have values in registers and potentially in memory, which then changes the way that I access them. It changes, I have to determine which ones I want to spill. In fact, I don't think, I don't think register spilling is a solved problem. I don't think there is, obviously you can brute force and try everything, which works on small graphs, but I don't think for, for arbitrary size graphs, we have found a solution to spilling and basically deciding which things you should spill to memory because that now makes that aisle register more expensive. Um, so there are a lot of things that you kind of have to keep in mind there. Uh, what I'm probably going to implement is I will probably spill whichever aisle register won't be used for the longest amount of time. So I would say like, okay, uh, I need to keep this ILR, like, I need to allocate a register to hold this 8A value for ILR82. 
and then I would look through all of my active IL register allocations, and then I would find which one won't be used for the longest time, or maybe which won't be used in a loop, or, or there's, there's so many different algorithms you can implement there. Um, and then I'll spill that one, replace it, and say that now 9a lives in that register, and then when we get to the instruction that we spilled, we'll reload it back up into that, that register. Um, because one thing that I need to maintain in my IL is that when I actually perform an operation, all of the input registers and the output registers have to exist in a register. They have to be in a register itself. So like when I go and I perform an add operation, which is surprisingly hard to find. So when I go to perform an IL, oper uh, this add operation, I need to make sure that my JIT is provided with a concrete register for 126, concrete register for 124, and a concrete register for ILR20. And if it does not do that, I don't necessarily know if my JIT can access memory in, in that state, right? It might, it might be an opcode that doesn't allow a, a memory access as an operand, or maybe it has a really weird encoding for that, and I don't know which one of these can be a memory operand. So I'm going to ignore that, and it's going to be up to the register allocation to basically set up the environment before and after every instruction to make sure that all of the register, all of the IL registers that that IL instruction will operate on, will contain will be uh, based in a register at that time. So that's my little side rant on register allocation. Um, it's actually really fun. A, a lot of this like graph and optimization and compiler stuff is really, really, really cool. Um, I haven't really been reading much on it. I've just been like trying things out and seeing what works, uh, which is the way that I learn. So obviously I'm not gonna be doing things optimally, but I don't really care because uh, I'd rather learn than, than just copy pasta what someone says works best. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at our IL graph and we're gonna implement an optimization pass. And the way that we do that is we're just gonna do, uh, we're gonna add this did something. Uh, this stateful flag now technically matters. Um, and we're gonna call this like a uh, reg, reg prop. Okay, and this is how optimization works <laughs> in this. Basically, I have did something, which is false. I then try all of the optimization passes, and if any of them did something, then I loop again. If none of them did anything new, then I break out of the loop. Um, and what that means is that uh, like, I'll go through, I'll constant propagate a couple things. That now means that there are some dead IL registers, which means on the next loop, dead code elimination will see that there's some IL register that's allocated that's no longer used because the result of it got constant prop to some other thing. Um, so this loop is basically the core of optimization. It's, it's, so, it's so simple. Working with an SSA is just a treat. It makes these things so simple. So we're gonna make a uh, reg prop. This is gonna say, um, um, keep track of where target registers live in IL registers to remove unnecessary On, on, unnecessary, okay, uh, register reads and writes. Now what's uh, cool about this, and this will return a bool, and we'll just say false. Okay, so this should compile and build. It's not gonna do anything, of course. It'd be really nice. It'd be really nice if that just worked by, by making a, a name and a comment. Um, Maybe that's the future of development. But effectively, um, now we have to implement this, which is a relatively hard problem. So if we think about uh, what we're allowed to propagate, so SSA form means that we can never reassign an IL register. We can never reuse an IL register. And since we're graph-based, so my old ILs were block-based. So a lot of this new knowledge to me um, or a lot of this stuff is completely new to me. This is the first time I've ever implemented this like register propagation on a graph-based IL. So I'm going to make mistakes. 
you're not seeing an expert here. You're seeing someone try things out and, and learn. So one thing that we have to keep in mind is when, so let's say in, at the end of this function, so if we're going through this block, we can always do all of these optimizations inside of a block. Since we got rid of that call instruction, we can now safely perform optimizations of anything inside of a block because a block has no way of exiting except for at the end of the block. Um, blocks will never have, you'll never see an arrow into the middle of a block. That would be, it would get split up and you would see something like this where there's just a branch to another block and an arrow into it. So in this case, uh, let's focus mainly on this target 11. So target 11 gets stored with a zero and then target 11 never gets used again until it's overwritten with ILR 15. And effectively what we want to do in this case is we want to delete this instruction entirely. But to do this safely, we have to um, we have to kind of accumulate the state of these things. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through each of these blocks, I think, I think what I'm going to do. Uh, we're gonna start at block zero and we're gonna traverse the graph. And we're gonna go through each of these blocks and we're going to accumulate where the target registers live with respect to their IL registers. So in this case, we're, we're starting in block zero, we're traversing, we're traversing, we're traversing. We now see that target 11 is assigned to ILR zero. We're continuing, we're continuing, continuing, continuing. And then we get to here, and now target 11 is ILR 15. And what that will allow us to do is it will allow us to see that there's no register read of target 11 between these two points which means that this instruction can get completely deleted. But we want to go about it in a little bit more roundabout way um, because we want to get some other optimizations at the same time. So that is deleting something that's never used. But we also want to, um, if this were used, let's say this is instead of loading target one, uh, let's imagine that this is loading target 11. In this case, we wouldn't actually want this instruction to load from target 11. We would want this instruction to load directly from ILR zero, which we also know is a constant, which means that this would become ILR nine equals ILR zero, which is then deleted. And then all of the references to ILR nine get replaced with an ILR zero. So you get this like avalanching effect when you implement these optimization passes and a lot of things will, will start to change and get completely deleted from the graph. And I expect that we will probably get a 10% minimum reduction of the number of IL instructions. And in this case, all of the things that we're removing are memory loads and stores, which means that these are pretty high value um, optimizations. So, okay. So that's that block. So like inside of a block, it's pretty easy. You accumulate the states of like where things belong or where things live, but it gets a lot more complex when you get into another block. In this point, let, or at this block, let's say target one is loaded here. And we see that target one is stored with ILR zero here. Now as a human or as like a reverse engineer who's used to reading things in these graph formats, this will seem like really obvious. Oh, target one comes directly from ILR zero, which is true in this case. And the only reason that is true is because block zero is what we call a dominator of block four. That means that the, a dominator basically means that um, when something dominates a block, it means that that block, the block that dominates it, is, the, is always executed or always like it's, it's higher up in the graph and the flow always must go through this block for this to be the case, um, for, for this to be, uh, for this to dominate this, basically flow must always go through the dominator. Um, so if we can find a counterexample, that would be like these two. So let's say in this block, this block is loading from target two. And this block, uh, since, it's loading from target two, um, we need to figure out like, okay, where do you get that, that target two from? So 
as a human, you might be tempted to scroll up in the graph to go look for target two here. And you see, oh, target two is set here. It's ILR zero. But that's not always the case, because if we actually look at this, this block, we see that this block can also be executed from this path. And I picked a bad example because this one doesn't write to target two, but this one could. Like, let's say instead of writing to target six, this wrote to target two. And that would mean that when this block is entered, target two could be, um, target two could be written to by this block or by this block. And that means that we would have to use the same register allocation for that same IL register um, in these cases. And since IL registers aren't mutable, since you can't, for example, in this one, uh, when I say that uh, target two is equal to ILR zero, I can't simply modify ILR zero in these blocks. That's not allowed in SSA form. So what you have to do in this case is you have to insert something called a fee node or a phi node or whatever you want to call it. And basically, uh, that's going to tell you the different places that that variable could have come from, if that makes sense. So uh, a fee node in this case, let's say this wrote uh, target two is ILR 146. And then in this case, target two is written to, let's say 127, even though that's not true. Um, this block, when it would access this target two, it would use a fee node that would contain uh, basically a tuple of, uh, it either came from 146 or it came from up here in the 127 or whatever random number I said, because we're just making stuff up. Um, and then when the, the load occurs down here, this would actually come from a fee node, and then that would propagate through all these different things. And we're probably not gonna do fee nodes tonight because that's gonna be a little too complex. Uh, so we'll probably do a little bit simpler of an optimization pass. We're gonna do inside of block optimizations so we're gonna make sure that basically at the start of a block, uh, th the first op optimization pass we're gonna write tonight, we're gonna optimize inside of a block. We're gonna make sure that the target registers are only loaded once and only stored to once. So they'll get loaded to in the first load occurrence and they'll get stored to in the final store occurrence of the block. Um, and that's, uh, let's see, I don't think, yeah, we don't optimize any of those values. So everything inside the block, we can optimize really easily. So we don't have to worry about that. And then we can expand that just a little bit without having to hit fee nodes by saying, um, when you load a target register in a block or store to one, if, if and only if that value has been written to in a dominator, and from the location it was written to in the dominator to the location that you're accessing it, there is no possible path through the function that would cause that target to be written to again. So fee nodes is, are, are how you're gonna get everything. That's how you're gonna have like a, a true perfect version, but we're gonna get the approximate version because that's gonna get us in the right mindset to think about the problems that we might have going forwards. Um, so does that make every make sense to everyone? So we're gonna make an imperfect implementation, but it's still gonna be huge. So like in the case of this block, right? Um, we're gonna omit a lot of these, like target zero and six getting set, zero and six, zero and six, zero and six, zero and six, six here, a six here. Um, we're gonna be able to reduce inside of the block. The fee nodes are kind of a, a a logarithmic advantage. You're you're putting in an exponential amount of of development time and code complexity for a very small improvement. So what we're gonna do is gonna get us like 80% of the way there with very little work. And then fee nodes would be an extra 4x the work, but it would only get us another like 20%, you know, improvement. Um, not 20% overall, but as an optimization pass. So we're gonna keep it really simple for now. And I've done in internal block uh, optimizations before because my old IL was block only. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into regprop. And what we're, we'll quickly just write the initial one. 
So we'll get access to the flow graph. And we're going to use that to basically traverse all of the instructions. Simple. Wasn't too bad. So we're going to go through each node, and then we're going to have state in in the no, uh, in the nodes of basically the um, target register mappings. So we'll call this target reg mappings, and this is going to be equal to hash map new. And this is not optimized at all. This is very inefficient. We're creating allocations in the loops, which if you ever allocate in a loop, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, in fact, we can make a performance improvement by just doing this. Right? So now we've moved the allocation outside of the loop. So we won't reallocate. We won't hit that uh, massive overhead of performing an allocation. And instead, we'll just clear the map. We'll just kind of update the internal length and state. Okay. So, all we care about in this optimization pass are target loads and stores. So we're going to say that if, uh, if the instruction is a uh, isle inst reg read, and that takes that as an output and then a target register. Uh, we're just going to print. We're going to say reg read at this and this. And we're going to put in an uh, instruction identifier just so we can kind of take a look. Oops. Enumerate. Um, print starting reg prop pass. Okay. So we've got a, a reg read at uh, node and I, I, and I think I have a pretty printer for node. I might not. Yep, we'll just put a question mark in there. Now it is. Problem solved. Uh, yep, and since we don't actually put anything in that database yet, uh, we'll just do target reg mappings dot insert. And this is going to um, mapping. This is mapping from uh, target registers to the most recent occurrence of an IL register, which holds the respective value. So on a register read, we're still going to emit the register read, and then we're going to update our mapping, and we're going to say that uh, you can find this target register at that location. And we're, gonna, we're just going to make this strongly typed. We're going to say this takes a target regged and an IL reg. And that's just to make sure that we don't end up making a database of, of uh, references. We'll just put an ampersand there and that should fix everything. Okay. And then for all of our instructions, we're just gonna ignore them. I know we need to handle reg reads, but we don't care right now. Okay. And then this is going to update the mapping. Now that mapping is only valid for a block. It's not valid between blocks. But we can say, uh, we can see here uh, starting a reg prop pass. So we see a, a reg read at 11. There's a reg read. And then if we go to block uh, 24, which is probably a, a big one here, we'll see that there are a bunch of reg reads. And these should all be in order. So we'll see one at 6. We'll see one at 26. Blah, blah, blah. Like, we know it's correct. We don't necessarily need to print this out. So now what I can do is I can say I'll inst reg write. Uh, and this takes a target register and then a value. And in this case, we can say that after this reg write completes, target reg mappings dot insert target um, value. So we can say that uh, update that out, uh, update that aisle register out now holds the contents from the register target. And this is update that target now uh, target's most recent uh, write came from IL register val. Simple. Nothing complex there. We're, we're keeping that database around. Everything's good. Okay. So now what that means is when we perform a reg read, what I can do is I can say if, if, um, I might need to do like some scan ahead here, but we're we're just gonna we're just gonna do 
we can always delete reg reads. It, I don't think there's ever a situation where deleting a reg read is an issue. So we're just going to say um, if target reg mappings dot, uh, dot get or if let some ILR, so the IL register, and then we're going to get target, and that has to be a reference. So uh, check if this I or if this target register is held or if this target register um, contains a known IL register value. Uh, if it does not, then we updated it. So reads should only ever happen once. So we'll say we'll update the mapping after that. So in this case, uh, we can actually do an iter mute here. And I don't need the ii counter here. And don't need enumerate here. So now we have a mutable reference to the instruction. And what this means is that we're going to say if we have a target register mapping here, then um, what we can do is we can replace this current instruction with a basically a load of, of that IL register. So we can say uh, more specifically in, in the case of um, more specifically, I want to actually accumulate a replacement database. So what we're going to say is let mute replacements is equal to um, going to be a vector, and this is going to this is going to hold. Uh, I think I implemented uh, something called an IL location. Yeah, I do. I do have an IL location. Okay. So this is going to be a vector of IL locations, and then the, or actually, this is going to be an IL reg followed by an IL reg. And I might already have a helper for this. So if we take a look at dead code elimination, um, that's actually a bad example. Uh, deduplication. So deduplication is going to uh, basically uh, create a map of all the instruction types and inputs. Going to go through. And is this handling the replacement? Um, here we have this like replacement value. OK. Yeah, so uh, transform ILR, uh, ILREG inputs is effectively what I want. Um, so, OK. OK. So this is going to um, mapping of IL registers, which have been replaced to the new IL register that should be used instead. And then for these, we're just going to replace them with a, um, we're going to replace the instruction with an, just an immediate load. So an IL inst uh, immediate uh, IL word zero. And since no one's going to use that, that'll get uh, constant propagated out. And this immediate here has to have the output. So, um, replace this register read with a immediate and that's fine uh, this will get removed during DCE and the reason I don't want to actually remove it right now is because removing is a relatively complex operation that requires us to um, kind of potentially change some of the shapes of these these nodes uh, self graph um, uh, yeah, I need to do get mute dot unwrap. Same effect. Okay. So now what we'll see is uh, let's see. Yeah, so this isn't going to be right because Obviously, we haven't done our replacements correctly, so we're going to say replacements.push 
and we're gonna give the tuple, which will have the aisle register we're replacing. So we're gonna say out no longer is coming from out. Instead, it's coming from ILR. And in post-processing, we're gonna replace every occurrence of a use of out with a use of ILR instead. So we're gonna basically remap. So like if we were to look down here, let's say that ILR45 is supposed to get replaced in, you know, um, we would go through all the instructions in the graph and we would find any instruction that takes ILR45 as an input and then we would replace it with a different one. So we're gonna basically queue up that this needs to be replaced in post at the end. And we don't have to worry about DCE or anything because we don't return out early. And um, here we're gonna say, uh, we're just saying false here, which is not true yet. We'll fix that up. So I think this logic should be sound. And I'm just gonna grab a ref there. Perfect. Okay, print uh, requesting replacements of, and then we'll just print all of this stuff, replacements. And we'll really pre-print that. So this will now give us a listing of all of the replacements that this wanted to do. And uh, I'm not going to replace that instruction right now because that will get DC'd out. Um, or technically that's gonna get, uh, um, deduped. Okay, so we're just going to look at the final listing, and so this is what the graph looks like, and this is what our optimization pass is telling us to do. This is saying that it should replace all occurrences of aisle register 9 with aisle register 0. So let's take a look. Um, you know, we're going to convert to SVG so we can search. Uh, sp uh, folk IL, um, dot dot rs and we'll just do t svg svg done okay so now we're gonna get a a, a vector graphic instead which sometimes has like a, a worse formatting that's why sometimes I use png but here we go okay so now I can look and in our vector um, it's not always gonna be in the same order. Uh, we're gonna look at this aisle reg nine. So the reason it's not in the same order is because Rust hash maps are not deterministic and they change ordering. But this is the one that we care about. This is saying that all occurrences of ILR9. So in this case, we see ILR9 is coming from target one. And it's saying that instead of using ILR9, you should get your value from aisle reg zero. And if we take a look, we'll see that target reg 1 is written to with aisle reg 0. So this is saying that aisle reg gets synced through to target. And at this point, we should just remove this instruction and replace all uses of aisle reg 9 or ILR 9 with ILR 0. Um, and what that will, what's really cool about this right now is if we look at the ramifications of that, that means this instruction will get deleted, this will get replaced with an ILR0, ILR0 is known to be a constant, so this will get constant propagated, that will make ILR10 known to be a constant, which will make this get constant propagated, which will then get set into target zero. So just by performing this one replacement, we're going to remove three IL instructions from, from our graph. That is how important it is to like do these little things. They add up so fast. Um, and it's really only about that first couple percent. You don't have to do the crazy phenode shit between graphs and uh, like symbolic execution to determine like which parts of the flags can be set and not set at a given time. It's, that's overkill. It's, it's overkill. Just do the simple things and you'll get so much. So we're gonna go implement that really quick. Uh, I'll rig nine and I'll rig zero um, are gonna get replaced. And I'm gonna close some of these windows cause we're not gonna use half of these. Uh, I'll session, we'll want that soon. Uh, we don't need two of those open and we don't need the JIT open right now. Okay. Uh, so now we're just focusing on this optimization pass. So now we will replace the instruction and at the end, I'm going to say for um, 
old ILR, new ILR in replacements. Um, perform the replacements. And then in this case, we're going to say let um, uh, caused update equals replacements.len is greater than zero. And then this is going to return cause update. So basically, if if we have any replacements to perform, then that means we cause an update. So we return true, which means we'll continue performing optimization passes uh, while it's changed. So now I have to traverse the graph again. Um, we're going to go through every instruction and I'm going to say, um, inst dot, uh, I L reg inputs transform I L reg inputs. Okay. This. Okay. So I made a nice little helper for this. And what I can say is transform all of the I L reg inputs. And if I'm not mistaken, this will just cause this closure to get invoked. Yep. The closure will get invoked for every single IRIG input. And then I'll say, look at that. It's, I even use the exact same naming scheme. This is why I love working on like code bases kind of alone, because you end up, you end up writing the exact same patterns um, and it makes things so predictable. So in this case, if, if the IRIG is old ILR, then update it with new ILR. Done. That's it. Replacements complete. And now that optimization pass uh, for the initial portion is complete. We're now outputting way too many target. We're, we're uh, writing too many times, but we'll see that these zero extents are going to go away. And there they go. Um, we're now down to 204 instructions. And prior to this, we had 232. So uh, that calculator is so slow. 232 was the original after optimization, and then we implemented this optimization pass, and now it's down to 204. We removed 28 IL instructions, and it was, what did it start out at? Uh, 232. There you go. That's a 12% reduction in IL instructions with this, this much code. There's no risk here. We know we didn't make any mistakes because it's it's just easy to get this right like like there's no there's really no risk in in this um in this implementation so now what we want to do is uh basically now register reads will be sourced from prior register reads of the same target register or from uh prior register writes of that register does that make sense so now what I want to do is I want to improve this optimization pass. So here we'll see that target the target registers will get written to a couple times. So like target six gets overwritten, in this case with the same value as well. Uh, target six is overwritten twice in here. Target one is only written once. Target eight is only written once. But some of these bigger blocks, uh, target three, target zero, target six, target zero and six, zero and six, zero and six, one and six, uh, zero and six. So we have a lot of repetition of those. So what I want to do is I want to now remove all but the last occurrence of a register write in a block. So when I get to the end of a block, what I want to do is I want to remove any instruction that... Um, that is not the last one. So what I'm going to say is in this mappings, we have the target register. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to add another field here, an IL location. Um, actually, we'll do let mute uh, target reg writes, hash map target reg, and IL location. And this is going to keep track of where... And this is actually going to be a vector, in fact. Uh, this is going to be a little bit thrashy for uh, for perf. In fact, this can be an index. These can be u sizes. Um, this is going to be mapping for each block of target registers and the instruction indexes indices that 
right to the target register. So at the start of a block, so um, clear out target register mapping databases. And here we'll clear this out as well, target reg writes dot clear. And then when we do a register write, I'm going to do, and we do want to get this index now. Uh, we'll call this inst ID, which is typically what I call it. And then we'll throw in dot enumerate. And in this case, we'll say target register writes dot entry for uh, target dot or insert vec new. So this is basically saying get the entry in the table for the target register. If it does not exist in the table, then add a new uh, uh, empty vector and then return that vector. And then we're going to do a push of target. So this is uh, update where in this uh, function register writes occur to the respective respective registers. And yeah, we're doing a bunch of heap allocations, but we're not too worried about performance right now. Um, we can always go through and optimize this and tweak it to use fixed size arrays and stuff in the future. We don't, we don't need to worry about that right now. So this is at the end of the block. At the end of the block, figure out the uh, newest write to each register. So we'll go for target reg and then for target reg and uh, for target reg and the what do I want to call it uh, instruction IDs in this dot iter for inst ID in uh, we don't even need to do that print in block this uh, target reg is updated at this. And we'll say uh, target reg, or uh, this is block node, target reg, and uh, instruction IDs. And this should be correct. This is just going to be the locations of all of the writes. Uh, 846. 846. Uh, uh, expected U size. Oh, yep. We want to push the inst ID. And a warning would have told us about that too because that inst ID wouldn't have been used. Okay, so this is saying um, in aisle label zero, this is saying that uh, target reg one is updated uh, target reg zero is updated at 11. Yep. Uh, let's take a look at one that's done multiple times, 11. So this is saying target 11 is written at 7, correct, and 12. Perfect. So now what I have to do is the most simple algorithm on the planet. We're going to go for inst ID in instruction IDs dot dot instruction IDs.len minus one. So go through every instruction ID except for the last one. And then we're going to go, um, let's see. We're just going to get the, uh, we're going to let, uh, let um, node instructions is equal to this, so we can reuse it. Um, node instructions uh, get a mutable reference to this node and the instructions it contains. That's looking it up in the graph. And then here, we're going to say the instruction at inst ID will be replaced with a this. Done. 
uh, out in this case, uh, I guess technically we need uh, an output aisle register. Um, let's see. I'm just going to have this push the... Uh, Oh yeah, how, how do I how do I delete that? How do I replace that with uh, a, a useless operation? Um, I could I could implement a nop. I don't I can't really change the size. I can't remove it directly from the instruction stream at this point because then I'd have to update all of those in indices, and it's like really annoying logic i'd rather have uh all of the removal done only in dce because that makes it a little cleaner so like technically i could go through and i could remove um the instruction at this index um uh, yeah that can make it a pain I'm trying to think what i can replace this with and i i don't know I don't think there is anything I can replace it with right now. So let's uh, let's add a nop aisle instruction. Nop instruction that does nothing. This is used to mark uh, an instruction for deletion during an optimization pass and this means that we can worry about deletion of instructions only in one location um, these will get removed by DCE okay so let's take a look at add so pretty much anywhere where we implement these things so parameters uh, for a nop uh, I'll ins nop and these are basically, uh, this function is like programmatic accessors to things. So a nop takes no arguments. A nop has no aisle reg inputs. A nop is non-volatile, which will make it uh, suitable for um, DCE. This is where we implement the, the pretty printing of it. So we'll just say that uh, nop, we'll just grab this nop here and nop. Okay. And then this is uh, constant propagation. So it doesn't need to be implemented in all of those. Uh, same with this one, nop, oh, nop remove. <laughs> remove certain operations uh, with a known effect. Um, so, okay, let's see if that gets us what we need, uh, 872, I'll inst nop, I don't know if DC is going to pick that up, DC might not like it because it doesn't have a, um, okay, uh, um, what is going on here? Slice index, not implemented. Uh, oh yeah, for ref u size. Okay, this. Okay, nop not covered at three thirty. It is. Oh, that's in the JIT. Okay. Uh, SP full file source JIT. Oops, graph. Uh, allograph jit um 330 we just have to implement nop here and that's going to be a really hard one to implement a jit for i'll inst nop done okay and then 869 in i'll graph 869 target reg is no longer used here yeah, that's true. It isn't. Okay, so that's going to replace them with nops. And we'll see if the nops show up in the graph. If they show up in the graph, then they're not getting DC'd out. But I think um, 
Ooh. Okay. Uh <laughs> Look at that. DCE is is panicking in the non-volatile calculation at 423. So um Unless it's a mop. If self, if let I'll inst nop is equal to self, else this. Okay. That's just an assert I put there to be a little bit pedantic, which is good. Um, okay, and it looks like those are gone. So now we're down to 175 instructions. So uh, basically, at all register reads and writes, so register writes will be deferred until the final write, and all register reads will be sourced from the most recent write or read, whichever is soonest. That's, that's what we just implemented. And that wasn't too bad. That took us uh, about what? 20, 30 minutes. I don't know when we actually started writing the code. Um, so, and that not will get removed. Uh, is volatile. Uh, non-volatile. Okay. So dedupe, if it's not non-volatile, then yep. In this case, retain all the inputs. Okay. And then this case, uh, we go through all of the outputs and then we see if they're ever used. In the case of a NOP, it has no outputs. So um, that's good. So let's see if I have a replace. So in this case, we no longer need to do this. We'll just replace it with a NOP and we'll make that kind of the standard when we do a replacement. Um, remove the replace instructions. This should be in NOP remove, okay. And in this case, replaced. I don't think that one does any replacement in place. Okay, good. So that's done. So now we're down to 175 instructions. What did we What did we start off with at the start of the stream? If we just scroll up. 242, I'm guessing. Deploy, yeah, 242 is likely what we started off at. So we started at 242 and we're down to 175 over 242. So we, in one hour of development, we reduce the amount of instructions in our graph by 27.6%. How cool is that? Um, and if we look at our overhead, we went from um, we went from five aisle instructions per target instruction, or we went from uh, what was it at the top actually? We went from 7.46 IL instructions per target instruction all the way down to 5.46. So about two, we, we removed about two IL instructions per target instruction. And if we take a look at the JIT now, compared to what we started with, let's just uh, flip this over here. Whoop. Okay. Let's take a look at um, pre-stream pre graph. Okay, so this is the exact same code that we lifted. The, the initial code that we lifted is identical. And this block, let's, does it look a little bit cleaner? I would say it does. <laughs> so how cool is that? Um, before we were loading in a, an immediate, we were storing that into a target register, then starting a new instruction, we were zero extending, storing to another target register, um, loading some constants, which we still do. And the reason we still load these constants is because something later in the graph actually uses these constants. 
and thus we keep them around. Now, these, um, this now means that the lifetime of these have increased. Um, I guess it's actually the same lifetime as before. Uh, so I don't actually think we have affected at all the uh, register commit state because we, yeah, we we shouldn't change. We shouldn't have changed the lifetimes of anything. So then we have foo one, good. Then we have foo three. So foo one here, this was the previous foo one. It was uh, four to ten. So it was six instructions or seven instructions. And now it's three instructions. Um, really simple, not a complex optimization pass, and it's not perfect either, right? We're still we're still flushing out all of the target registers. So if we look at the end of blocks, we'll see the ends of blocks. We'll probably have a lot of writes to target registers, but that's fine. It's not a big deal. The amount the amount of instructions that we would reduce, um, basically we can actually like mathematically determine how much more we could reduce from this point. So before we could remove basically, uh, we, can re we can remove basically all duplicate reads and all duplicate writes. And now the only instructions that we can remove, if we were to implement crazy fee node lifetime analysis bullshit, uh, which I'm eventually gonna do because it's gonna be fun. Um, if we were to do that, maybe instead of like, if we look at here, here it gets target one, it loads target one in this block, and we could determine that target one here, we write ILR97 to here, and we could say that, oh, we know that we don't have to um, reread target one here because we can just directly propagate that through ILR97. So in this case, uh, that's actually doable because these writes here, since this do, uh, block dominates this block and there's no flow path, pl flow path to this block from this target write, or it was target one, basically there's no possible path from this location to this location uh, that would potentially cause target one to change. So we don't actually have to worry about fee nodes in this case. Um, so we could potentially implement that today. Um, the fee node stuff is is seriously a day or a weekend of work. Um, so that definitely won't won't happen this stream. Uh, let's take a look at. Yep, target one gets flushed out. Um, okay, so the only issue that we've introduced by adding this optimization pass is that if we have an exception. So for example, if we have an exception at this location, we'll break out of the IL and we'll say, hey, we have an exception trying to write to this address, whatever address this is. In this case, it's 9A. Um, if that were to happen, then uh, we would get in the situation where um, the target registers are actually not up to date. They're not correct. Um, so to make it correct, what I need to do is I need to keep around these mappings and I need to say at each instruction index that you can find the actual target register. So I could say like at this location, if you were to have an exception, you can find the value for target three in ILR 51 or so, you know, something like that. Um, so that would be metadata and that's something I'll just do. It, it's, it's easier. Uh, to just implement that as metadata. It's worth the performance to perform this optimization. So I can implement the uh, between, we'll actually just look at this. So I can implement the between node uh, optimizations. Um, and that would basically work if, if, an, if a target register is not written in like a certain path. So like in this case, if there's like a target six use uh, target three is used here and target three is not used here. So that pass actually, you know, it would save us, we know of at least one instruction, maybe a couple more. But there's another optimization pass that I really want to implement. Um, and I'm going to try and find an example of it. So 
Uh, we're probably not going to implement that pass uh, just because I, I just don't deem it as the highest priority right now. I implement my optimizations based on what is the biggest bottleneck. You know, we, we, did, a, we did a good job with that. We definitely can come back to it and improve it, but it's only going to remove a couple instructions here or there, which is not a big deal. Uh, there's another optimization that I think I can do based on zero extension. So currently... Um, actually, you guys didn't see it. So uh, on the 6502 emulator, I, I was having some issues, and I think still am because I haven't debugged it. I have some bug in this. Um, basically, all of these now use macros, like register read and write and memory read and write macros. And those macros all basically take the size. Uh, so when I do like a register read, if it's from one of the 8-bit registers, I zero extend it. If it's from a 16-bit register, I 16-bit zero extend it. Um, if it's a register write, I will zero extend the value prior to placing it in the register. So this basically makes sure that all of the values in registers are zero extended and all the things read from registers are zero extended. Obviously, I don't need to do both sides of that. That's like massive overkill because we're, we're zero extending things like... If we were to write a register, we're going to make sure it's zero extended, and then we go to read that register, and it's zero extended again. I think um, uh, I don't like. I I basically can do the zero extension only in one location, and I could do that. I think the more correct place would be to probably do that on reads of registers, and basically zero extend every time I read a register. And then if I write a register that's not zero extended, it doesn't matter because you can't access that register without zero extending it. Um, however, the optimization passes kind of just get rid of a lot of that. And that's, that's why these optimization passes exist. It allows me to write extremely verbose lifters that just zero extend, sign extend, do all this stuff willy-nilly. Um, and make massive amounts of code bloat. So if we look at the pre-optimized, um, let's let's do it. Let's look at what a pre-optimized lifting looks like. And I think you guys are going to be in for a treat here. Um, so we're going to go into aisle section, uh, dump dot, where it goes to dump the dot file here. Um, I'm just going to move this uh, prior to optimize and get rid of this one. Otherwise, it's going to overwrite it. So now we're going to get to C, and we'll keep that graph around. We'll uh, duplicate tab. Um, we're going to get to see what an unoptimized graph looks like. <laughs> and the optimizer does a lot. <laughs> we'll find out the optimizer is uh, pretty important. So here is an unoptimized graph. And we'll see that there are a lot of blocks. And the reason for that is I lift every instruction to its own block, and that just makes it a lot simpler. So the, the block zero just immediately uh, jumps to block one, and then everything gets optimized, or ev all, of the block, all of the blocks are their own instructions entirely. And then I have an optimization pass that looks for unconditional branches into a block that has no other entry points. So basically, if this branches to this block, and there's no other block that branches into this block, then I can safely remove this block and just append these instructions into this block. And that makes it just a lot easier when I'm writing my lifter of not having to worry about, you know, formatting these blocks and making sure that I have entry points at the right locations. I just lift every instruction as a separate block. And then when I implement a branch, it branches to that block and optimizations figure out that later. Um, it just defers all of that work, and it means I don't have to get it right in every lifter. I only have to get it right in the optimization pass, which is really important. So this kind of tells us some statistics of our optimization. So this is saying that our lifter, our 6502 lifter, lifted uh, whatever graph we were lifting into 367 IL instructions composed of 33 blocks, and 32 target instructions with this overhead, so this many aisle instructions per target instruction. And then after the optimization, we see that we're now at 175 instructions in only eight blocks. Obviously, the target instructions has stayed the same. 
um, and we've halved the amount of instructions we have. And these optimization passes aren't here to optimize the code. They're not meant to like make the code that we lifted faster. The goal is to make it so you can write more verbose lifters that are more generic and maybe perform more sign extension and use immediates and constants a little bit more frivolously to increase the likelihood that you don't have, you do not have a bug in your lifter. Because if you start making optimizations in your lifter where like, okay, I'm not going to zero extend it here because I know it should be zero extended in this other location. And uh, yeah, no, just fucking zero extend it and let the optimizer figure it out. Same goes for code. Same goes for like actual development when you're writing Rust or C or C++. Um, not as much for interpreted language, but uh, languages, but for compiled languages, write your code verbose. If you don't get the performance qualities you want, then rewrite it. Don't, don't preemptively reuse stack variables because it's like, I don't want to reallocate something on the stack. The compiler will figure out those lifetimes and do it for you with 100% accuracy, except for compiler bugs. And you just don't need to worry about it. So this optimization stuff is more to make it so you can write easier lifters, and that's it. So yeah, side by side, if we were to look at these, we'll see the, the net kind of goal. We'll see that the, the first instruction, just setting our target register to zero, that one we weren't really able to optimize because what are you going to do there? Um, technically, we could actually... Um, yeah, there's, there's actually no way we can optimize that. Um, then we have the next instruction here that was previously 12 instructions and it gets reduced to three. Um, so here we see like another load of a zero, which will get deduped here. Um, we see that that's gonna get zero extended, which gets constant propagated out so it can remove the zero extend. Then it's written out to here. We know that we don't need this ILR2 because that got constant propagated uh, to this uh, new value, which then got computed to zero, which we then deduped and knew that there's another zero on the stack or in the in the path. Um, so yeah, it looks so much better. We don't have these expensive shift operations, um, and the code should behave identical. So if we do deploy, this is not going to work. Um, oh, failed to run dot. That's good. Um, we don't want to generate the graph anymore. But yeah, that's that's kind of the beauty of, of optimization. Um, and it's, it's just so easy. So this is the exact same result as I was getting before. I'm getting an access fault on this FFFF. I think this is probably like a sign extension issue on the stack, um, but I'm not quite sure. So that's um, something I need to debug. Oops, sorry. Uh, let me check if the zero extensions are Correct. So what I want to do is I want to add um, kind of deduplication logic. And basically, if you ever take a value and you then zero extend that value, let's say you zero extend it as an 8-bit value, and then you zero extend the results of that as a 16-bit value, it's a NOP. If you ever do a zero extension of a value which has been zero extended, for greater than or equal to the number of bits that you did a prior zero extension of, uh, we could potentially drop that zero extension. So what I want to do is I want to look for uh, any extensions, same for sign extension, a, a sign extension of eight bits and then a following sign extension of a nine bit thing has no effect. The nine bit extension provably has no effect and we could remove that. Um, I don't know if that's a pattern that's getting generated here. Um, actually, here. Here we see uh, ILR35 is equal to the zero extended ILR31 of an 8-bit, and that is a zero extended 8-bit from 30. And where's 30 from? 30 is a zero extended ILR22 of 8-bits. So this is exactly what I was talking about with like prioritizing your optimizations we could go implement a really complex optimization pass to get some of these like dominator removal things between blocks. 
or we could focus on a, an issue that we have right here in hand, which is that we're doing zero extensions of things that have already been zero extended. Is this the same? Uh, that's a 21. That one's fine. Um, so like optimizing this zero extension uh, would actually be really difficult. Um, it, well, this one, it's not possible because you can underflow. Uh, let's see. Do we have other occurrences of that? Not in this case. In this case, uh, 157, which came from target 2. And target 2 was just read in this block. Um, 159, 161, 162. So here we have a zero extension directly following. So this is going to be what we're going to watch. We're going to implement some optimizations. And this is specifically... Uh, what we're going to look for. We're going to look at this uh, F03A instruction. So I'm just going to make note of that. And we know that F03A has a double zero extension. It takes something, zero extends it, and then zero extends it again with the exact same value. Um, so I, I don't know if this deserves its own optimization pass or if this should go into... Nop remove, and I think it belongs in nop remove. So this is this will create the constant database, and then in here, uh, basically this nop remove, I manually implemented some some nops and and things that can kind of get resolved into a constant value. So in the case of um, in the case of an add with zero. So if I add to something, and if I do an add or an or instruction, and one of the values is a zero, I know that I can remove that instruction because it's it's oring with zero or it's adding with zero, and we know that that will have no effect. If we're subtracting zero, it's the same thing. Um, but only if it's the second value. If we're subtracting from zero, that could have an effect, but subtracting zero from something, uh, that's fine. So in this case, we perform that redirection. If we and with zero, um, it should just become zero. And I, here's where I can add a bunch of little things. I can add like XOR with self or technically, yeah, XOR with self will become zero. And uh, what else? Oring with yourself. Uh, will just be yourself, and ending with yourself will just be yourself, and ending with zero will be zero. So there's a bunch of different things. Actually, and with zero, I do implement here. Um, so we're just going to steal this, and we're going to add another pass. We're going to say XOR. Um, XORs with self can be replaced with a zero. So we'll say if X is equal to Y, then it's a zero. Remove not true. So there you go. We now have uh, XORs with yourself um, being replaced with a zero. So that's kind of how easy it is to just add new optimization passes like that. Okay, I think I put the dump dot back on. I did not. Okay. So we will want that. Okay. Obviously, that's not going to really get us anything. That That isn't the goal. So... How do I want to implement this? What are what are the rules? Um, what are the rules? We know that zero extend of a value. So if we do let uh, result is equal to a zero extension of bits, and then let result is equal to uh, We'll say let final is equal to zero extend of results of any bits uh, um, if bits is greater than or equal or if uh, new bits is greater than or equal to bits. Uh, this case we know that um, the second zero extend has no effect right we if we zero extend if we zero extend a value 
by bits, and then we zero extend it again, but treat it as a greater than or equal to sized value than what we just zero extended, then it has the same effect. And I think we can say zero and sign extend. And I think that holds up, right? There's no situation. If you do a sign extension of the same size, it's the same. And if you do a sign extension of a larger size of something that was previously signed extended, it's also the same. So we can make that assumption. So here we'll say the, um, the second zero or sign extend has no effect. So that is one algorithm we know. Um, and they have to be the same type. Uh, if we sign extend something and then zero extend it, obviously that, that, that could potentially change it. However, there's another one that we can implement, which is if, so uh, in English, performing the same type of extension twice with the second extension, uh, performing the same type of extension twice with the second extension using greater than equal to the number of bits in the first, first extension. The second extension had no effect. Okay. Now, there's another one that only works uh, going from, sign, uh, from zero, extension, zero extension to sign extension. And that is, if you zero extend a value, um, if we zero extend, only zero extend, then we make a final value where we zero or sign extend that value, and the new bit is greater than, not equal, but greater than, um, then, uh, then the second has no effect. So do you capitalize, is, is, is English a proper noun? I think it is. Yeah. Okay, in English, um, performing a zero or sign extension on a previously zero only extended value of a greater than bit size from the from the zero extension the second extension has no effect right is that true if we were to take an 8 bit value and sign extend it and then we would or if we were to take an 8-bit value and zero extend it, and then we sign extended that as a 9-bit value, yeah, then the top bit, the most significant bit, will always be zero. Um, this is because the most significant bit, we'll type it out, bit of the uh, originally zero extended value will always be zero. Thus, the sign extension will always behave as a zero extension in this case. All right? So those are the those are the optimizations we want to implement. And we have one candidate in our graph that will show us uh, that our optimization worked. Um, so let's implement it. Uh, how do I want to do that? Basically, I need to have awareness of where where aisle registers came from and the types. Uh, I basically need a database of where I can find the instruction that created an aisle register. So, um, we're gonna do, we're gonna do both in here. We're gonna do aisle reg to location. Um, created a database of that, uh, and we'll just say database of which aisle regs contain constant values, and then database of aisle reg creations to the um, aisle instruction which was uh, responsible 
for creating it. Okay. So, and technically we could maybe go with a little bit less data. Um, I could say I'll reg to extension. Yeah, we don't need to make it that generic. If we make it that generic, we just increase the amount of data we have to store. So we're gonna say a database of aisle re registers, a database of aisle regs to um, whether they were zero extended or, s or sign extended, uh, bool true value indicates sign extension. Um, or sign extended, and the bit size of the extension. And then this will be a mapping from a tuple. Um, and then the size is just a U8. Okay. So then we'll say if the instruction is a zero extend, then we don't actually care about the value. Um, we do care about the size. And in this case, it's an IL word. And sign extension is basically the same. Uh, it's going to be easier to just duplicate the code instead of doing another match inside, I think, here. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, so we'll say, you know what? Can you do, I wonder if there's like a more creative way with match syntax. I, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. So we're going to say, uh, I'll reg to extension dot insert out reg, and then we'll provide false and the size as U8. And we're going to assert that uh, size is greater than or equal to 1 and size is less than or equal to 63. Uh, that's kind of what we've made sure. So internally, it should never get to that state, but the assertion is basically free, so we're just going to keep it there. Um, and keep in mind, all of this optimization stuff doesn't actually affect the uh, performance of the JIT. So if, if it takes longer for us to do optimization passes, it doesn't affect the JIT. And I don't really care about the spin-up times. I don't care about how long it takes to lift and generate and optimize. Um, is none. Uh, whoa. Multiple IL reg mappings of the same IL reg. You know, we don't even need to give a message like that. That's that's just implied here. Okay. So then for sign extend, we're going to have an output register and then the size. And in this case, it's the exact same, except it's true. So the size is greater than or equal to one and the size is less than or equal to 63. Yep, true size. Perfect. We don't have to worry about truncation here because we know that it fits within a U8 in all cases. So simple. Uh, and we probably have some like curly braces or, or things uh, assert that is none. Nice. Okay. Can't cast. Uh, yep. We'll just uh, throw a couple DRFs in here. We could technically borrow the whole the whole thing. But we'll just do this. Okay, outreg. Yep. Same thing. Done. Okay, so now we have this database of extensions that occurred. So we accumulate all this information. We basically know where things have been signed, extended, and zero extended. And now we can go in here and we can find, we can say, IL inst, um, an IL instruction, perform remap, break, find knobs. Okay, perform remap, remove knob, okay. So that's probably what we're gonna have to do. Um, 
I might actually make this perform remapping like we did in the other one. This one looks like it does it in a, a kludgier way. Um, I should make a remapping thing, uh, like a generic thing I just handle. So if it's a, a zero extend, and then output, input, um, output value, and then uh, IL word size, if that's or this, uh, sign extend this, then we're going to say let cur type is equal to match, uh, match inst. And here we'll say a zero extend maps to uh, false. This maps uh, sign extend maps to true. Okay. This is uh, unreachable. Okay, so determine the type of the current instruction. A true value indicates uh, sign extension. Otherwise, it's zero extension. Nice. Okay. So now we just care about the input value here. So we'll say let input uh, if if let sum um and then this is going to be the bit size. That's just a mapping to U8s, right? Uh, bool U8s. Um, uh, old type bit size. If this is equal to the name of this database dot get um, val. So we're going to look up if the input to this IL instruction previously came from sign extension. And if it did, we'll say um, if the if the old type is equal to the new type and the uh, cur size, and we'll say the old size. Uh, let cur size equal cur size as u8. That's just uh, to clean it up. We didn't have to do the assertion because the assertion would have already gotten executed when we uh, traversed the graph initially. So that this one I'm I'm fine with not asserting. So if the old type is equal to the new type, and so if it's the same type of sign extension. So we'll add some comments here. If the input value for this extension came from an extension itself, then if it's the same type of extension and the uh, new extension is simply a larger uh, size, and the new extension is greater than or equal to the old size, then we can remove the new extension. So if the old type is a new type and the old size is less than, uh, if the we'll say if the new size is greater than or equal to the old size, then print candidate for extension removal. Obviously, we're not doing anything yet. Uh, new type. Um, yeah, cur type. Uh, we'll say new. New type. Uh, new size. If the old type is equal to the new type and the new size is greater than or equal to the old size, then... And we can just ref that. Uh, 1140 here. Okay. Um, oh, we got some borrowing issues. Uh, 1131. Uh, doesn't like that. Use of borrowed in here. Okay. Well, we can just ref these. Oh, do we? Do they need to be mutable? Um, 
Well, in this case, we can just do this. I don't think we're going to mutate these instructions in place, so we should be fine. We don't need to deref there then. Um, and then val, we want to ref that. This, uh, these have move implemented, so it's not, uh, it's not a big deal. Um, unused variable out, of course. So we should see a couple move candidates. That... Oh, it's going through the optimization pass a couple times. Uh, there aren't that many candidates. <laughs> I was like, that, whoa, that's a lot. Um, so what we'll say is the, um... The out goes to val. So we'll say that the output operand can be sourced directly from val. I was like, man, there's no way. It's, it's probably only like one or two in this graph. It's actually not too many. Um, oh, that's that's a surprising amount. Five. There are five of these. Huh. Okay, let's take a look. Now, this is saying that ILR30 can be... Um, ILR30 can be replaced. Is this the most recent graph? Okay. I was about, whoa. Woo! Losing my mind there. Okay, this is saying that ILR30 can be replaced with ILR22 because the zero extension is a knob. So let's take a look. ILR22 comes from a zero extended ILR21, uh, which, yep. That is, it's exactly the same. It's performing the same zero extension. So if the old type is equal to the new type and the new size is equal to the old size, then it's a candidate for removal. I think we just got that logic right. We can just go implement it now. So what we'll say is, um, when we want to perform this mapping, we'll say that uh, perform remap of our instruction ID we're starting to get uh, pretty indented here. Um, perform remap is set to um, out. We want to remap it to um, val. So a performer remapping from out to val. So let's take a look at an example. So this one's saying that if we are Adding or oring where the x value is 0, we can simply replace the result with y. And yep, so we can say replace the uses of out with val, and we're just noting where this uh, replacement needs to occur. And then we'll implement another one. We'll say if the old type is equal to false, which is this logic, um, if the old type is a 0 extension, um, so if the old type is a zero extension and the new size is greater than the old size, so um, zero or sign extending values that were previously zero extended, zero or sign extending values that were previously zero extended using a smaller size can be removed. Uh, values that were previously zero extended using a small... So if the old type is false and the new size is explicitly greater than the old size, then we can perform a remap in that case. And that's like this logic here. Okay. And I think that's done. Right? Out val. If it's a false, then that's zero extension. Let's double check up here. Um, up here, if it's zero extension, it's a false, otherwise it's true. And if the new size is greater than the old size, so let's say w we zero extended something that was 8 bits, and then we sign or zero extend it as a 16-bit value, there's nothing that we can do. I think that logic is correct. We should be good. So let's see what we got. We had 175 before, and this brings us down to... 170. Okay, so that removed five instructions, um, which is a, a five over 170, uh, 175. There's a three percent reduction, which is not too bad for a, for a simple algorithm there. And those uh, were relatively expensive uh, um, operations in the JIT. Oh my God, we I think this is our first instruction that has been completely deleted. Let's see if that is correct. <laughs> the, 
there's there's a chance there's a bug. So this is TXS. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, so this is decrementing the X register, and then this is moving the X register to the S register. And we actually don't have to do anything in this case because we can reflect that entirely in our IL. So basically, while this looks like nothing occurred, what this did is internally to the IL means that when we go to access the stack register, we have changed the where it's going to get sourced from, if that makes sense. How cool is that? How cool is that? So somewhere in here, we're probably going to use the stack in PHA. So TXS is, th this is going to, um, that's updating those. So DEX. I think the X register, let's see what our um, register IDs are. So we see that register X is target one. So target one is written to with ILR22. And so we know that ILR22 is the stack. Um, ILR22 is in target one, which we then move target one into target zero, one, two, or uh, three. So target three, when we go to use target three, when we perform our load operation, we use ILR22 directly from the X. We, we have aliased the X register and the SP register. And then since this performs a subtraction because it decrements the stack, here we're taking ILR22 and we're subtracting 20, which is a one. So we're taking the stack pointer and we're subtracting one. And then we write that, we zero extend that. And then we write that out to... Uh, target three, which is SP. So we have completely removed all code from this instruction because we can handle it entirely at the IL. Um, in this case, we have an instruction that's loading a constant, but the constant's not actually used in that instruction, but it will in the future. Um, yeah. So another optimization pass I want to add will be moving immediates closer to where they're actually used. So in this case, it does use it relatively soon. Um, actually, F01F, this is probably going to be a, a like load X or load A. Yeah, load A4C. So here we're going to um, uh, F01F. Um... I'm kind of confused why that is happening on that line. Um, LDA. Why are we seeing the 21 marker? I feel like those are getting like swapped. I don't think my IL performs reordering. Let's see. But this is going to take an 88 here. And this is going to take 4C, and we're going to write 4C into uh, 88 directly here. Um, I don't know how that happened. Int start. Um, like, I would expect to see the 4C load here and the 88 load here. Um... I don't know I don't know why that's happening. It's not necessarily a bug because it's still performing the correct operation. I don't think I have reordering. The only way is if this instruction for some reason loaded a constant 88, but I don't think it would. And also we shouldn't see the 21 marker before 4C gets loaded unless it defer I don't I don't know. It's starting to get smarter than I am. Um, let's uh, let's remove optimizations before we dump our dot, and let's take a look at that example. So we'll do duplicate that tab. I know that I have like a bug in the lifting right now. I don't know what the bug is. Um, that's what we'll be doing pretty, probably right after this, actually. Um, so let's take a look. F O one F. So F O one F. Previously 
was loading ILR 52 with a 4C, and then this loads it with an 88. Ah. I have no idea how that could get reordered. I've, I, it might be some really weird effect of constant propagation where things are getting propagated through zero extensions. Oh yeah. Um, cause here it's reading that register. Oh, that makes sense. It, it does make sense. So here it's reading this target zero register and then it zero extends it, which means it looks like the creation of the value that's actually going to be used, um, has been moved down. Um, and then the obverse for, for 88. Actually, I don't know how 88s get moved up to be on. Oh, 88 was already before the instruction start marker. Um, and that, uh, I'm guessing, um, oops. Uh, yeah, so the instruction start marker, um, we're putting, we're putting after we do some decode. I, I have no idea why I put it there. Um, we're just gonna put it way at the top. Lifting instruction here, graph. Uh, start marker. Okay. So that makes sense. Um, yeah. So now it's inside the block. It, it That wasn't a bug. It wouldn't actually affect anything. The instruction start marker doesn't actually affect code execution at all. So wasn't a worry. And now we should see the optimized one. Uh, we'll see the 4C and 88 loaded on the same instruction. Yep, we do. And down here, we see the same thing. In fact, we're starting to see a lot of instructions that no longer do anything at all. These instructions are completely just markers in assembly. How cool is that? How cool is that? Yeah. So like, this looks really complex, but this is because it's doing flag updating. And since it's the last thing to do flag updating in the block, of course, we're going to see that. Um, this is where fee nodes would help us out a lot because our flag updating could be deferred to the final block in the entire graph. Um, but like I said, that will come later. So we're down to 170 instructions, uh, down from the, I think the initial like 230, 245 or something. So we have like a 30% reduction of aisle instructions, which will probably correlate to like a 40% uh, performance speed up in the JIT. Uh, I really like to see that. Um, that's really cool. So nice. So now we can, uh, start deploying this out and start trying to debug what we, uh, what, what we're doing wrong in our 6502 lifter. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed kind of doing that optimization graph sort of stuff. Um, it's new to me. I'm definitely not an expert. Uh, I hope I don't come off as like uh, someone who's saying how these things work because I, I don't necessarily know how a lot of these things work. Um, I just kind of am logicking through them and making kind of assumptions. I'm just doing some co code formatting. When I see things go over, um, oops. Uh, when I, when I see things go over 80 columns, I try to fix them up and that, that's how you maintain 80 columns better. Um, just kind of keeping an eye on those things when they go awry. And now this file is fixed up. So that looks great. Okay. So when we deploy it, we get this MMU fault at pff. So this is saying we have an access violation trying to write one byte to, uh, FFFF. And this to me... I don't know, right? <laughs> I don't know for sure. But to me, this stands out pretty strongly as a, it's probably a sign extension issue. So one issue that I found very difficult about the 6502 um, and the way that I've architected my lifter probably is the problem. Um, but effectively, the 6502, when a... Um, I like zero extension versus sign extension is a really hard problem. So if I, if I sign extend, uh, like SP, then I'll end up using all F's 
as an address, and I'll deref that. Um, I could zero extend it on when I go to access it, which is what I do. So when I go to read memory, I actually zero extend it after I read it. And uh, here is a here is a two byte read. There's actually a chance that this is where the bug is. Maybe the two byte read is implemented incorrectly. Um, so my IL uh, part of the standard uh, requires that all loads and stores are aligned. Uh, that makes a lot of the logic in the MMU JIT a lot easier. It's it's literally like a three x reduction in amount of code that you would need. Um, so effectively, uh, when I'm lifting an architecture that supports uh, reads that can be unaligned or writes that can be unaligned, I need to break those reads and writes into their individual components. Um, if I really wanted to optimize it, I could uh, I could potentially like detect whether it's unaligned and if it's unaligned, then I could you know do the slow path. So. Basically, I have a memory in 6502. So if I look for memread, uh, graph.memread, it's only in these locations. Uh, same for memwrite, it's only in these locations. And it means that I'm going to make sure that my emulator always, or my lifter always uses these macros when it dispatches loads and stores. And that means it can kind of wrap the behavior to match the architecture. In fact, if we wanted to add masking here or uh, emulate kind of the the like masking of the address such that the address space repeats itself like a lot of legacy hardware does. We could just add that in these two spots and we wouldn't really have to worry about anything. So in this case, if we're past an, an address, um, and actually, this should be Xerox sending the address. Uh, memory 6502. I, I think I found the bug. I, yeah. So the way that this works, I'll explain it a bit, mainly because that will help me understand what the fuck I'm trying to do. <laughs> so memory six five zero two, uh, you pass in three different arguments to this macro. And in this case, if I, uh, you pass in these three arguments. The first one is the address. The second one is the size of the address in bits. It'll get zero extended up, and then the value in bits. And what this means is that when I, uh, so I match on the value bits, and that determines if I do an 8-bit read, uh, read or a 16-bit read. If it is a 8-bit read, I will read from the address, which I have very quickly spotted my bug already. Um, and then I will get the value from that, and I will zero extend it my memory 8 implementation, all of my memory read uh, functions in my JIT return sign extended values. So I need to explicitly zero extend these. So uh, I, I read the value and then I zero extend it as an 8-bit value. Obviously, we can see what my issue is there. Um, then in the 16-bit case, we read the byte at address. That's the low byte. Then we zero extend that, um, which once again, it seems like that's not necessary, but my memory eight returns sign extended values. And that's something that I might be willing to change in the future, but typically on architectures, sign extension is better than zero extension. That's why, um, that's why like your addresses on x86 are sign extended and not zero extended. Pointers are signed values, not unsigned values. Um, so I'm kind of biasing towards that. It seems like 6502 might be an exception. As I implement more lifters, I might decide to change my IL specification to return zero extended values. I don't know. So here I'm going to zero extend that low value. So now I have a 64-bit value that contains a zero extended 8-bit value. I'm going to load the constant 1. I'm going to take the address, and I'm going to add 1 to it to get the adder next. I'm going to read the byte from there. Um, I'm then going to shift that value to the left by eight, and then I'm going to or that in place. Uh, so, and that should be fine because the shift left will leave zeros in place of the bottom eight bits. We'll then or in the bottom eight bits from the low value, and then we'll sign extend the whole thing as a 16 bit value. So that actually looks correct. Um, if we take a look here, 
this is the same thing. We have address, address bits, value, and value bits. And this means that you specify the bit size of the value that you're providing. So in this case, Memorite 8 is easy. We don't have to worry about sign or zero extension because this will only end up writing the bottom byte, uh, the least significant byte into that memory location. Uh, in the case of a write, we do a Memorite 8 of the value, write the least significant byte, that's fine. We get immediate 8, we shift it to the right by 8, the value by 8 to get this high value. We then uh, load a 1, we take the address and we add 1 to it, and then we write to that location with the high value. And that looks correct as well. So the issues that we have here is it doesn't seem like we're actually using adder bits. And I, I don't know why I implemented these functions if I'm not using adder bits. So we'll make adder will be equal to graph.0extend. I'm guessing these got deleted when I refactored to have zero extension explicitly in my IL as an instruction before I was using a uh, mask, um, like an actual immediate and an and. Uh, everything. <laughs> yeah. So we'll do adder, and then this will be based on adder bits. IL word. Okay. So then... Those address bits, they'll get the address will get zero extended, and then we'll use that address. And then we're gonna do the same thing up here. So we're just gonna get the address, and then anywhere where we use adder, um, instead we'll use adder without a dollar sign, and we'll call it adder zx uh, to reduce kind of that confusion. So zero extend the address based on the number of address bits. Then we're going to read from that uh, this adder zx, adder zx here, and then this adds adder zx. Perfect. Then we're going to do the same for memwrites. Uh, right here. Adder zx, adder by address bits. Then we're going to replace adder zx for all of these. And this we're adding one. And I'm guessing that's going to fix our bug. So I'm guessing that we were writing a stack register. Oh, whoop, spoke too soon. Um, okay, so now we need to look at where we use them to see if we correctly use these. Um, so here we say, uh, when we do an indirect address type, and let's pull up our handy dandy reference. Uh, close those, pull this up, uh, 6502 address types. Um, these are going to get us kind of, I forgot where the, the good one was. Oh, I actually like this a lot. That's really cool. Uh, indirect. So the jump has an indirect, um, has a special indirect addressing mode that can jump to it, stored into a 16 bit pointer. So we read two bytes from current PC into immediate address. We then, that's already zero extended. Um, and then we do a mem read using that as a 16-bit address. Uh, and a, we want a 16-bit value as the result. And then that will be an address. Okay, so we should actually just review all of our um, addressing modes because this if we have this wrong, then everything's wrong. So uh, implied, none. Accumulator means we're operating on the accumulator register as a register operand. If we're working on an immediate, um, uses the 8-bit operand as the value. So that we take the immediate, and I sign extend that. Um, I might want to zero extend that. I'm going to zero extend it. So we're going to read this, uh, that should be a U8. Um, we're just going to, we're going to start zero extending everything, I think. Um, we'll worry about sign extension in the places where sign extension matters, which seems to be uh, fewer places. It seems like fewer places actually use sign extension than zero extension. And thus, for this lifter, we're going to default to zero extension and then special case the sign cases. So for an immediate, we just read the next byte, we grab it, 
we zero extend it, uh, we load it into an immediate, and then we return that out. Perfect. For zero page accesses, we will get uh, uh, zero page fetches a value from the 8 bit address in the zero page. So we're going to grab this. We're going to uh, zero extend this uh, location, and then that's going to be the address. So don't have to wor worry about sign extension or anything there. Okay, zero page X and Y. So zero page indexed, that's going to take the argument plus X mod 256. So we're gonna get the immediate argument, which we're going to zero extend. We're then going to get the X or the Y register, and we're going to read that register. And reg read will correctly make sure that we only get an 8-bit zero extended value. We're then going to add the immediate value with the register value. And then we're going to zero extend it on an 8-bit boundary, which is the same as modulo 256. And that's the address. Good. Relative. Uh, this is just an immediate, if I'm not mistaken. It's just a, an 8-bit signed offset. So this one we do want signed. We read the next byte, return that relative. Perfect. Then we have absolute. Absolute fetches the value from a 16-bit address anywhere in memory. So we grab a 16-bit value there, and then that's just, that's it. We're done. Uh, we don't have to worry about sign or zero extension there because um, it's, the, it's the full width. Okay, then we have absolute x. Uh, yeah, these are absolute indexed. So these, we're going to get the immediate argument, which is a two-byte. So we're going to get the two-byte thing into immediate address. That has been, we don't have to worry about extension on that. It's just a U16. Then we're going to get the X or the Y register. Then we're going to get the immediate into the IL register, and we're going to zero extend it. We're going to add the, uh, we're going to add the argument plus the register, good. And then we're going to zero extend that to make it mod 16, which this doesn't show the mod 665536 uh, because it's just implied by the size of an address. And then we're going to place that in the address field. Okay. And in this case, that one's fine as well. Okay. So that's correct. Indirect. What is indirect? Indirect is this special, which is, uh, it's a pointer. So in this case, we get a value, an immediate, and then we treat that as an unsigned thing. So we zero extend it. Then we use that as a 16-bit address to read a 16-bit value, which is the indirect, uh, which is the address uh, for an indirect operation. Perfect. Then we have indexed indirects which uses the X one. And this is where we might have a mistake. Uh, oh, what? Okay, that, that behaves a lot differently than what I thought it did, I think. Wait. Wait. It adds to each byte? So it ha there's... There's an 8-bit, holy shit, okay. Well, uh, yeah, I think we got this massively wrong. Um, wow. Wow. Uh, I really wish this was in, like, RPN. <laughs> so it looks like these are our internal brackets here. Yeah, these two. So this takes the immediate 8 and then adds X to it. Is this just a really complex way of, of implementing what I'm doing? No, because it has multiple peaks. Times 256. No, I, I think this is a complex way of, of implementing what I'm implementing. Yeah. So we're going to take a value, a U8 value. We're going to zero extend that value. We're going to get the X register, and we're going to add those two together to get... Um, 
that should be an 8-bit. Yep, mod 256. All the peaks are mod 256. And then that, we're going to read a 16-bit value at that location, and that's our address. That looks correct. Um, this formula... So this is reading the byte, the first byte, and then it's reading the next byte, and then it's multiplying that by 256. This is this is the same as reading a 16-bit value. Um, if you write it, uh, if you take that into calculator, you convert it into RPN. Like if I had the HP calculator thing, I've actually never done a conversion to RPN. Um, I think we have that correct. I, I think what this is doing is a very manual, because this is multiplying by 256, the next byte that was fetched. I think this is a, just a very manual way of showing. Um, why is it written like that? It's so weird. This might be like how it's actually done, maybe. I I don't I mean, it's an 8-bit. Maybe it's like, I think the 6502 can only do 8-bit reads. Um Okay, so then the indirect y, this one, it will grab the argument, okay, convert that to that, and then use that zero page offset as an 8-bit address to get a 16-bit value, which is, um, yep. I think, th I think what this is saying is that when you read memory, that is modulo um, the, like, yeah. So if you were to read an FF byte, it would, uh, it would modulo, yeah, if you were to read a 16-bit value at FF using a null indexing mode, uh, or a null page, or a zero page indexing mode, you would actually read the first byte from FF and the second byte from zero. Even though it's a 16-bit address space, it wouldn't read outside of the zero page. And that is why they're they're showing it like this. Um, that, that actually makes a lot of sense, and I need to mimic that in my stuff. Uh, I, I doubt that's my bug. But, so we're going to peek the argument, and then this is going to peak the next byte of the argument, and then it's going to add y. So it's going to read a 16-bit value um, at the zero-page offset. Uh, then it's going to get the y register. It's going to add that to it, and then we zero-extend that to get our final 16-bit uh, address. Actually, peak, peak that. Yeah, that's not mod. Yeah, neither of those are outside mods, so yeah, we do want those to be stored as 16-bit addresses, um, which is good. So I think these are correctly implemented. Okay, so the next thing we can look at is our our read and our write. So um, when we do a memory write, we want to, when we do this add to get the next address, we actually want to zero extend it on the same boundary. Um, so we'll do adder next is equal to the, the adder next zero extended. And that means if we're doing an eight, if we're using an eight bit address, we'll maintain that eight bitness such that the next byte that we, uh, the next address correctly wraps mod the, the page size. And in this case, we want to do the same thing. Um, that's mem read. So this we're going to get uh, adder next. We'll get adder next is equal to adder next um, zero extended by adder bits. Okay. I don't think that's our bug unless this is using a wrapping. Um, yeah. That would only be an issue if in our very specific case, it was using a wrapping pointer across the zero page boundary, but, but it's not. Okay, so now let's look into the implementation of our instructions. I'm pretty sure this is perfect. I, I didn't see a single bug in here. Um, I think everything is correct there. Uh, okay, so when we perform a load, we want to mem read using adder as a 16-bit value um, 
from eight. And I think, I guess this could technically promote. I mean, we've we've sixteen bitted this. the The thing we just implemented by zero extending is still broken. Um, so all of these should be zero extended to sixteen, and they are. Uh, actually, in this case, it's uh, eight bit zero extension. But that's still that's still fine. Um, let's see. We're gonna load using this as sixteen bit. So we're gonna make a xxx uh, um, need to preserve uh, need to preserve bit size for adders. Um, such that uh, zero page indexing is mod the zero page for, well, I guess it doesn't matter because this is, uh, since it's an 8-bit read. Since loads are always an 8-bit read, it doesn't matter. Um, so then in absolute mode, we will uh, get the value, we'll zero extend it, and then we will read it as a 16-bit address um, of an 8-bit thing. Perfect. Uh, this one, when we write, we will use 16-bit addressing for both of them, correct? Um, and then it's an 8-bit value, correct. Um, and we don't have to worry about the 0x sign extension on writes. Uh, update the negative flag. Uh, here, what we're doing is we're shifting to the left by 56 and shifting to the right by 63, or shifting arithmetic right. That will basically uh, take the eight, it'll take the seventh bit zero indexed uh, seventh bit and um, sign extend that to the whole register size. So that's correct. Uh, this, if the value is equal to zero, then we will um, uh, then. If it's equal to zero, then this will be set to all ones, otherwise all zeros. That's correct as well. Okay, and next instruction is the current PC plus the instruction size. We set up a label. CLD, clear the uh, decimal flag. We just write zero into it. Uh, load the X register. We perform a load. We then get the value from that load and we store it into the X register. We update the negative and zero flags. Let's do a, a check LDX. FX flags N and Z, correct? Um, LDY, same thing, N and Z. On the Y register, LDA, same thing, N and Z. STA, STA, uh, store accumulator, does not affect any flags. It's just going to take the accumulator and store it at that location. Perfect. Uh, STX is the same, store the X register. We can just do store y we can implement it while we're here so it costs cost nothing to just do that a x y uh, t x a there's also a chance that there's a bug in our jit unlikely um i mean yeah uh, moderately likely i guess maybe i don't know um t x a the JIT's so new that that is actually pretty likely that there's a bug there. TXA is going to um, transfer X to A. So we read the X register. We write it to the A register. We then update the zero and, and negative flags. K, I, and X. Increment X. We're going to get the X value. We're going to get an immediate. We're going to add one to it. We're going to write it out. We don't have to worry about zero extension. That's handled by the macros. Um, and update the negative and zero flags. OK. I and Y. Increment Y. Exact same thing. Increment. Uh, this will increment based on a, a memory location. So this will get memory, add one to it, store it, Update negative and zero flags. Okay, dex. Uh, decrement x, get x, get one. We subtract one from it. We store that. Update zero and negative. Good. Uh, txs, transfer x to the stack pointer. Uh, here we just read x and we write it to the stack pointer. 
Uh, no flags get affected. Um, blah, blah, blah. The stack is always at page one and works top down. Yep. PHA. This is where it gets a little bit uh, complex. We get the A and the SP register. We do a write using SP as an 8-bit um, address. And we write A, which is an 8-bit value. Or 8, yeah, 8 bits. And then we uh, subtract one from the stack pointer. So stack pointer, uh, sub one from that, and then write it out. Okay, looks good. Uh, B and E. Okay, uh, this is going to get the, uh, it should always be a relative, B and E, B, E, Q. Um, we're gonna get the zero flag and a zero. We're gonna do a wrapping add of the next instruction plus this offset to compute the target, create a label for it, uh, push that we want to explore those. We're going to get the B and E up. Uh, if it's a B and E, then if the zero flag is equal to zero, then it was not equal, is non-zero. Thus we go to the true target. Otherwise we go to the next instruction. If it is equal, uh, so if the zero flag is equal to zero, then um, I just flop, uh, flip the direction. So the true target is now the next instruction. Uh, so if it is equal to zero, if it's zero, go to the next uh Do we have this opposite? No, no, this is right. If the zero flag is equal to zero, then it is non-zero, which means, yeah, we do want to just flip those. That's correct. Okay, JSR. Jump to subroutine. Uh, pushes the address minus one of the next operation onto the stack before transferring control. So get SP. We're going to subtract one from it. Um, we're going to then write the current PC plus two. Um, since JSR is always three bytes, we just do current PC plus two. We're going to memwrite to SP as an 8-bit write the return address which is a 16-bit value. This, yeah, that's fine. Um, then we're going to subtract one more from the stack, and we're going to update the stack pointer. Uh, and then we create a label for that absolute target, and then we're going to branch to there and continue to the next exploration. Uh, in the case of a jump, we allocate a label and we branch to it, and we say that we want to explore that path and then go to the next thing. And then RTS, uh, this is RTS. So, um, transfers control to that plus one, so we get SP. We're gonna add one to the stack pointer, so now it's pointing to uh, Word. Um, we're going to read from that as an 8-bit value, uh, a 16, as an 8-bit address, we're going to read a 16-bit value. Okay. And then uh, technically that's that's wrong. That's that's our bug. Holy shit. Our, our very last instruction is our bug. Um, let adder is equal to graph.add adder1. So, um, wow. Wow. Yeah. So memory 6502, SP8, that will uh, add another one to the stack, update the stack. And then when we do this bind, technically we want to do let adder is equal to graph dot zero extend adder. Uh, uh, I'll word 16. Because technically that could go, if, if the address is FFFF, if it added one to it, then that could cause it to go to the next one. Um, okay, branch indirect there, all done. Good, go to the next exploration. Um, actually, are there any other places where we perform arithmetic and then do a branch target label? In this case, it doesn't matter. Um, I guess technically it does here. We would want this to still be modulo the address space. We'll come back to that. But I, I think this will fix the bug. This means we are returning to the wrong at. Oh, my fucking God. <sighs> Spoke too soon.
add one to the address, zero extended, and branch indirect to that. Well, I would have thought that would have been it. Son of a bitch. Is that the only place we use bind right now? Yes. Okay, so we're gonna go into bind here and we'll do, uh, oops, in our JIT. Okay, uh, bind. If we get to a bind instruction, uh, we're gonna do uh, asm.int3. This will cause us to break into the debugger and we'll take a look at where we're trying to indirectly branch to. Okay, we're not getting to an indirect branch. So we're not getting to ret. Um, and okay, so that means, so this is the end of the function, right? This is the, this is the ret from the function. Um, if we're not hitting that, then we're faulting earlier. Um, uh, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Uh, Uh, how do I hack this real fast? Real fucking fast. Uh, 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 I need like a, I need a, um, shit. I need a trace. I need a trace. Um, God, that's so hard. Fuck. I broke my emulator today, so I can't use the emulator to debug it. And quite frankly, I don't, uh, I want to focus on the JIT anyways. Um, uh, okay. Um, uh, R15. R15, we're going to make a, a special, special meaning for, which will be uh, instructions executed. Okay, this will output into uh, R15 insters exact, insters executed. Probably, probably should put some commas on these. I guess it doesn't care. Okay, cool. Um, instructions executed is going to be equal to U64, and then up in our JIT at inst start, uh, we'll do a if true asm dot add uh, actually we can just do an ink I think I have implemented reg r15 oh I guess we don't have an ink probably because inks are typically not too good um, we'll just do add one to r15 okay perfect then down here we'll say uh, print exited with instructions executed. Okay. Perfect. Ballpark. Am I in pain? Oh, yeah, always. Always in pain when my when my bugs when my when my code ain't working. Uh, executed with a thousand forty four instructions executed. Okay, cool, nice. Now, maybe I'll have R15 be uh, a tuple, uh, an address to a tuple. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's, okay, we'll do, uh, we'll just do a little bit of a uh, const Tracing bool equals true. Uh, enables tracing in the JIT. And we're going to say like JIT tracing to make it really obvious. Uh, of VM number zero. Okay. Then. Eh. Of. Enables tracing in the JIT of the active VM. Of the following VM. There we go. Now we're in business. Okay. So, uh, then we're gonna have here. Uh, 
if jit tracing, then we're going to uh, let mute trace is equal to vec vec uh, lots um, lots. Just give me just give me a uh, give me a bunch of these. Okay, thanks. Um, then if jit tracing uh, jit trace adder is equal to this. Ah, uh, yeah, we're gonna need to do some scoping and stuff. Gross. Okay, if jit tracing uh, let trace is equal to if jit tracing trace else none semi sum trace um okay and then we need a count of instructions executed so uh the trace is going to actually be uh, uh OU64 followed by a vector okay cool some trace Okay, perfect. Okay, jit tracing. Then we're gonna pass in a into here. It's now an input. We'll pass in to R15. We're gonna pass in trace dot map X. And then this is gonna be <laughs> hmm. Let trace is equal to uh, OU64 followed by jit tracing, and then that's going to create the allocation. Now we won't wrap it here. Okay, that will be a little bit better. And then uh, this sum trace, let trace. There. We're going to do this. Uh, let trace raw is equal to o u sixty four followed by and this is going to be mutable and directly followed by a trace dot map x x dot as mute pointer dot unwrap or uh, standard pointer null mute So it's going to be a tuple with a zero followed by a pointer to the trace. If a trace exists, if a trace does not exist, then it's just going to be a, and we can do like vec with capacity. Then we won't initialize it. Um, trace, uh, we're going to get the mutable pointer for the trace itself. Here we can just do this. Okay, uh, potentially allocate a trace buffer. Then this is uh, create a tuple with a pointer, uh, with a ins instructions executed, executed counter and um, create a tuple with an instructions executed counter and a pointer to the trace buffer. Cool. Uh, we could also pass in the size of it, but, uh, you know, you know, you know, we'll get it working first. Um, are tuples fix, uh, are tuples deterministic shape, or do I need to put this in a rep or C structure? Uh, rep or C uh, struct raw trace uh, U64, mute U64. Okay, this is gonna, yeah, there you go. Problem solved. Whoa, 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 whoa. What's going on? What's going on? Unclosed delimiter on our map? No. Unwrap over here, here, okay. 
Uh, way down here. Okay, yeah, 944. Uh, mutable reference uh, to trace raw as mute raw trace. Okay. And instructions executed. This is now going to be trace raw.0. Okay, and can't borrow with mutable 754. Um, is, it, is it like map mute? As mute? No, map. Can't. Uh, oh, I can make this mutable. Okay, and that doesn't need to be mutable. Okay. Cool. And this, we can actually have that be this. Um, ref me X. Oops. Yeah, we, we'll use pointers. <laughs> okay, so. This should just crash, to be honest. I'm surprised it's not. So this is now going to be a mem access uh, based at uh, sum R15 with no scale and uh, a zero offset. OK. So execute, ex exited with zero instructions executed. This should now tell us the instructions executed. Oh, now, okay, now it crashes. Uh, R15, we, we zero it out, don't we? Nothing to see here. Okay. Uh, 1044, looks good. So now, um, we want to get that value prior to. So we'll do asm.move mem racks or reg racks from this so uh get the instruction count and increment it by one okay looks good and then we'll do asm dot move into this bad boy of a scalar of some based on racks with a eight multiplier. No, we got, we got to get the pointer. Um, so the pointer we can get at none eight, uh, get a pointer to the trace, to the trace buffer. Let trace is equal to this. Uh, tr let trace pointer. Oh, yeah, we're we're in assembly right now. Reg racks. Um, okay, now we can do a asm dot move at the memory location pointed by some racks with a scalar of. I guess we should use rbx here. Uh, rbx with a index of eight. With zero offset, we'll write the PC value, which we'll put in RCX. Perfect. RCX, let's make sure we're fine on our clobbers here. I think we are. Um, scratch, nice. Okay, get the uh, PC as an I64 loaded into RCX, and then we're going to move... We're going to uh, load RCX into that memory location. And we just need a square bracket. OK. Now down here, uh, we can get the let inst trace is equal to, um, we'll do unsafe uh, if let sum mute. Uh, I guess we can just do. 
So now we do have to make this mutable. This is called trace. Trace has the buffer. Uh, we'll do we'll do an if let sum. Uh, if let sum trace buff is equal to trace. Okay. Then we're gonna do an unsafe uh, trace buff dot set len to trace raw dot zero z size. Okay. And then we should be able to do four pc in trace buff dot iter uh, print executed a x pc um, set the length of the trace buffer. Okay. Uh, nine forty nine. Mute trace, uh, brrr, uh, as mute. Should do the trick. Trace borrowed here. Um, moved here. Seven fifty four. Uh, as mute, okay. There you go. Okay, that doesn't need to be mutable because it's now a mutable reference. That, okay, that makes so much sense. Uh, 951, of course, none of this is, un everything's unsafe in this function. Set the length, and we should be able to see all the PCs were executed. <laughs> oh. Or, or, or we could seg fault. Um, okay, so we get R15 0, we add R15 non 0, we get R15 non 8, uh, we deref that into RBX, we then uh, load an immediate. Oh, this should be racks. Look at that. This is a typo. Holy shit, we did it. Nice. Uh, okay, so now we have a trace. Uh, we'll just do like log.txt. Uh, log and we'll just like doop, 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 control C. And we'll do this. Okay. So. Okay, we start execution at. Ooh which looks good to me. And we're gonna want register state pretty soon here, but uh, we're just gonna, we're gonna ignore register state temporarily. So we start at foo, we go to foo one, we go to foo three, looks good. We go to foo four. Uh, and how do you like delete upwards? I can just remember the line number, 2730.77. You know. not great okay vm exit perfect okay foo one three then we have four this should execute uh 256 times um g not containing this d 256 looks like we looped correctly so at the end of the loop, we should have a, instead of executing four, uh, okay, four, five, six, seven, the loop terminates, we execute nine, which then is a jump into FO1F, looks good. Uh, then we, uh, FO21, 23, 25, 27, 29, 2B, 2D, 2F, 3-1, 3, 3, 3, 5, 3, 7. Okay, that looks good because it's a fall through. 3, 8, good. Uh, branch if equal to 3A. I'm guessing we want the inside of the loop. That's probably correct. And then 3C here. So we have a store using 8A Y indexing. 
For some reason, we're getting all Fs. If we take a look at 8A, 8A is written to up here with a store A, uh, 9A, and then at 8B, 00. So the address should actually resolve to 009A. But for some reason, the address is resolving to f um, which is a bit of a problem. So uh, this is using the Y indexing. Um, so the, the hard question here is, is the value in memory incorrect at 8A, or is our translation incorrect? So let's take a little, let's take a little squiz, a little peek, a little poke, a little prod. Um, okay, we can close some of these Vim windows. I'm just cleaning up some Vim windows. Okay, so if we take a little squiz, and we'll just do a, a print adder this contains this, let adder is equal to ox, uh, we want to read 8a, contains a, and we're going to do, uh, oh, we don't have access to the MMU, shit. We don't have we don't have MMU access in this function. Um, uh, here's what I can do: a more creative route. Uh, if PC is equal to OX FO three C, uh, asm dot int three. You know, it's the it's the little things that count. Uh, DREF. Okay. We'll just deploy that, run it in, in Jitiba. Good. Okay. Run. Uh, okay. Sig trap looks good. Um, is it faulting on our read now? If we look at our trace, is it now faulting on our read? No, oh, well, we lost our log file. Um, Oh, it faults on 3A. Um, and then that fault was handled. Okay. And then we get an access fault on that, and then that one does not get handled. Okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, how are we getting the VM exit print? Oh, uh, this is before the trace. So running, 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 running. Okay, so we're, we're at that location, X10, XG. If we take a look at, um, or X10I PC, we're, we're about to execute a read and uh, X ten X G. The address we want to read from is going to be in ZMM four. So if I do I R ZMM four, oh, this is reading from a f f um. Hmm. Well, that. That seems to not make much sense. Um, that seems to not make much sense. What could cause that? That could be... Huh. 
Huh. Huh. Uh, X and I PC minus 10. There's our int 3. There's our FO3C. So the instruction is starting. So this instruction is starting. And somehow, we're dispatching. How are we dispatching a load right away? Uh, this is Y indexed. Oh, so it's going to deref 8A. Well, that's just, that's just wrong. Um, is this just our Y indexing? We like, what sucks is we audited that code. I hate when you audit code and then you find more bugs. Uh, Cause that means that you didn't audit correctly the first time, which means what else did you miss? Uh, so this is a, this is an indirect Y. And I mean, this could be like an optimization bug in my JIT. It could be a JIT bug. So here we're going to get the current PC plus one as a U8. We're then going to get the zip go. We're going to get the immediate as a U size, and then we're going to perform our mem read here. And if we take a look at our, our mem read routine, like this is, this is what we're going to uh, print dispatching read to x in cur pc plus one. Okay. Um, yeah, it's fine. It's the first execution run. Okay, so... At FO3A, this is saying dispatching read to 88, and then it's going down to dispatching read at 8A. Looks good to me. And if we take a look at our IL graph, which shouldn't have, ch it shouldn't be changed. So we're gonna lift, uh, lifting instruction at this. Is it because we jump to a different instruction, maybe, when we're lifting? I don't think so. Uh, FO3A, here we see a DRF of ILR60, ILR60. Ooh, maybe we do have like an optimization bug. ILR60 is 88. And... Wow, maybe we have a reg register allocation bug. Well, shit, that would suck. Oh. Okay. Because the instruction at FO3A should be a write, or it should be a read of address at 60. And the address at 60, we're seeing. Let's take a look. Maybe, maybe we did something stupid. Um, ZMM4, has that executed it yet? No, it hasn't. ZMM20. Okay, ZMM20 is 8A. Oh, that's, I mean, hey, if I find bugs in my JIT, that's fine. Um, Cause a, a, a bug that's like universal is, we need to fix them. So hopefully it's a lifting bug. So in this case, ZMM20 is indeed uh, that. And then K1, let's uh, double check. K1 should be all Fs, looks good. So we're gonna step into uh, step into display I PC, X and I PC. Um, so we're about to go into this call and we're about to provide it with, in this case, ZMM4. And ZMM4 is an 8A. So it's, uh, it's a bunch of 8As, which is exactly what we want to read uh, in this instruction, which means that the memory contents are bad or our translation is bad. So we're going to dispatch a read to there. So if I do a, uh, how do you step over in, in GDB? GDB, 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 step over, call. GDB, step over, call. I think it's N. Next, NI. Okay, X and I, PC, NI. 
Okay, perfect. Oh, thank God. Okay, so ZMM6 should contain the results of the read. And we read the first, we read the bottom byte at that address. And in this case, we have uh, in ZMM, uh, I, R, ZMM6, FF. <laughs> Load X, load A, store A at 90. So what should be at that address, um, let's take a look at X10, XG of R, uh, where's the page table? Page table, R9. So here's our page table entry. X10, XG of this. K, X10, XG of this. This. Okay, so that is uh, our page size. I think we have set to 10. So this should be, uh, so those are bytes zero through eight. And what I wanna do is I wanna add OX80 times the byte that we're interested in. So if I did zero, uh, and here I want to do x, uh, x 16 xg. What? Is that right? Is that right? Oh, um, this needs to be masked off. Okay, that looks better. Okay, so now um, I want to look at byte 88 hex. Shit. How big are my pages? Uh, I want to look at 88 divided by 8. <laughs> so this is the memory at 80. I guess we, we want 8A. So at 8... Yeah, so this should include that. It's all zeroed out. FF. Uh, is that correct? 88 divided by... 80 times 88 divided by 8. Um... feel like that's right. If we take a look at the null page, everything's zeroed out. If we take a look at uh, uh, F, that's probably out of bounds. Yeah, that's probably out of bounds of, of, this, uh, of this mapping. So if I take 88, which is the address I want to look at. Okay, we're just going to do this. Uh, we'll do this uh, 16... Uh, I don't know, uh, 1024. Okay. Everything looks zeroed out. Okay, what's my page size? Uh, page table ah 10 bit pages that should be in there okay so why would that be translating to ff for reading at 8a for reading at 8a 
Okay. Um, <sighs> hmm. Um, yeah, it should be writing to that memory up here. Store A to 8A. Let's take a look at this instruction. Welcome to the hell that is debugging. Um, okay, so this is broadcasting those contents into those ZMMs. Uh, step instruction. Okay, X10. Uh, I, R, ZMM4. So this is the address, and then ZMM6 is the value we want to write. So we want to write a 9A. We want to write a 9A to the memory located at... Uh, what are we at? We're at 2.9. So at 8, using address 8a. Okay, that looks good. Um, so xn xg r9. xn xg this. 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 Okay. That looks good, and then we can look at uh, uh, 512. Who ever wants paging? Okay, so let's uh, let's take a look. Uh, I guess we're gonna do a uh, step instruction. Okay, so we're performing a translation of CMM4. Uh, display IPC. Uh, we're checking for equality. We're seeing if we can go down the fast path and uh, or if we need to go down the divergent path. We don't have to, so we extract into RCX. X, uh, I, R, RCX, that should be, oops. This should, this should be 8A. Yep, that's the address, perfect. And then uh, RDX. RDX is going to contain, uh, this is the page table during the page table walk. Um, RDX, yeah, and that's what we walked, right? X10XG this, X10XG this, X10XG this, X10XG this, okay. Uh, X10 I PC. See you around, George. Thanks for hanging out today. Uh, 30 IPC. So we've got the translation happening here. So we're going to rotate left by 10 to get the top bits. We're going to look up uh, all the different levels in the page table. Racks is going to contain it. So step I. Okay, so this is saying racks. Oops. Um, IR. So Rax is the index into the first level. Okay. Rax is the index into this next level. Looks good. Into the third level. Looks good. Rotate left six. Now we're on the final mapping and three F uh, I R Rax. Looks good. X10, XG, RDX plus 
racks times eight. This is going to be the, okay, step instruction. Good. Uh, if it's zero, then we go to the failure path. It's not zero. Uh, we fix up our address. Let's check our address. Let's see if RCX is correct. It is. It's 8A. Looks good. Uh, RSI, uh, we test the alias bit. Wait, is this memory aliased? If it's not equal, we go to CD34. If it's non-zero, which it is. Okay. Uh, do we not handle the aliasing exits in our... Unless that's our first write to that page. It's definitely not our first write to that page. Our writes might not be... No. Um... Uh, okay, MU source JIT, okay, so we're in translate, uh, we walk through here, we want to, there, uh, we didn't have to check alignment, we just did our page table walk, and uh, the dirty bit, is that bit, is that four? Yeah, it probably is. Yeah, this is definitely the dirty bit. Okay, so test RSI with the dirty bit. Um, if it is not dirty, then we jump down to already dirty, X and I, PC, in which case we're about to do uh, update the page table lookup, which is based at RSI. Oops, X10, XG, so that's our page table. Looks fantastic. Um... Mask off the metadata on the final translation. Okay, here we mask off the metadata. Okay, so now racks. X10 XG racks. Um, or RDX is our final translation. Looks good. And now we're going to look up the index. So we're going to go step, step. Okay, now we're doing vectorized again. Um, X10, XG, RDX plus RCX. This is the, uh, this should be the 16 giant words corresponding to this memory. Looks good. Um, and that should be equal to like RCX should be RCX is equal to 880 which is uh, 16 times that which should be equal to if I did uh, if I did uh, 88 times 16 because it's 16 bytes per byte yeah that's correct okay like I I know my MMU works because I have I have unit tests for this shit. Um, shift left logical. Unless I don't have my byte punching stuff working correctly, but it should be. Uh, so we're gonna shift left. Uh, so we tested the permissions, multiplied the byte alignment by eight, uh, shifted into position. Compare if it's equal. Uh, check if the permission's good. The permission is good, so we don't page fault. Now we're going to perform the write, which is uh, a ROAR VQ. So we're going to rotate the permissions into the... Uh, permissions. Oh, because I have to update the permissions. Yep. So we're going to do a uh, step, 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 step. Okay, permissions get updated with uh, IR ZMM0. Perfect. Okay, now we're going to perform, we're going to get the, that, whoa, where's the right? Oh, the rate doesn't occur yet. Okay. 
Okay, so that's going to return out. Now... What? Well, that might be a massive bug. Holy shit. Holy shit. We, uh, we, oh, wow. Whoa, 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 whoa. We don't invoke right in our, in our templates. If it is right, then we invoke this. Is that clearing the assembly? Well, it's pretty obvious what's going on. Um, let's go back to like 16. So we perform a call where we invoke, we invoke the translation. So we perform the translation and then for some reason we never perform the access. Oh, uh, this should do both, right? X. Yeah, that should do both. That does the translation and then it performs the access. Oh. Um. Okay, that's doing the page table walk, testing the bits. Uh, jumping to 34, once it gets there, it's going to do that. If it's not equal, it's going to go there. Uh, X10I, this. Is it performing the store? Maybe it is. Uh, rotate right, uh, Roar VQ. Let's take a look. Oh, yeah. So this ret... We need to dispatch calls. So this is returning up. Yeah, so the code does directly follow it. Um, but these are meant to be calls. You're supposed to call these. You're not supposed to directly use these. Um, so I need to make this code emit uh, a call to translate. So this will generate the assembly, which I then need to log those locations, and then I need to call the two of them. Wow. All right, so basically all of my memory reads and writes were just doing nothing. Um, okay. <laughs> well, it lines up with what we were seeing, uh, which is good. So at least I'm not like massively confused. <laughs> uh, okay, so how do I do this? Um, uh, carry the five, square the one, find the derivative, do a couple tangents. Uh, I think. The issue, well, I know what the issue is. The issue is obvious. Um, but what I need to do is figure out how I want to create this magical mystery machine. Um, I just will do a temporary mapping. Uh, uh, JIT. Uh, translate adders. This is going to be a hash map of the U size, which is the operation size to a U size. So address addresses uh, mapping of the operation size to the oh, yeah, they're, they're, they're in here anyways. Okay, so uh, we're going to have bool uh, uh, 
JIT adders. Uh, mapping of the... Wow, I can't believe I missed that. I mean, yeah, I guess that's easy to miss. I didn't know how I input. I, I, yeah, I guess it makes more sense to do it this way. I gotta have it jump to the end. Yeah, you know, I like this. I, I like having the calls a bit more, having the explicit calls. Uh, that Yeah, the explicit calls make sense because I've got some very future crazy aisle stuff I have planned where I want the translations to be separate. Um, okay. We're going to get the mappings of the uh, operation uh, is right operation size to translate funk uh, access funk. Okay, nice. Look at that. You size, you size, you size. And then I need this to ret? No. I invoke both of them. I do a call to both. I do a call to both. Yeah. Okay. Okay. MMU jits. This is where to find the MMU operations to the JIT address for the corresponding uh, translate act handlers. Okay, nice. Boop, boop. These are intended to be called back to back. Populate MMU JITs. This is gonna go and insert, uh, this is gonna be the translate. And then I have another way of getting the base address here. So this is gonna be asm .asm uh this will be the access it will be equal to asm asm. How do I do that? Uh, I think it's uh, before I do this stuff. Call. Okay, JIT adder. Uh, get instruction address. Uh, save the address of the access. Okay, so we're creating assembly. We're writing in the translate routine here, which will return out, and then we're also then writing in the access routine and then we'll pass this the translate and access see was that really that hard uh 282 jit okay so jit Nice, okay, and this is not happy, perfect. That makes sense because this is gonna be the translate and access. And then we'll just do a call of translate followed by a call to access. We got some, okay, uh, call translate and access. Okay, In three MME fault true, that should be fine. Okay, we'll get rid of this int3. Where else do we have int3s? Cool. Okay, what's happening now? MMU fault at 3C.
son of a bitch. Oh, this is a this is an actual bug. Yep. This is a lifter bug. Okay, we're back to lifter bugs. Um, so at 3C, we're having an issue where we're trying to write to 100. Um, is that, is that what this is trying to do? Is it STA, DRFing 8A, that will get, so let's see, do we execute? 3C a couple times? No, this is on our first time. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> we fixed the bug and we're on the exact same instruction. <laughs> okay. But I think we fixed that, right? Translate access. It's intended that we call them back to back. Okay, so. Absolute 3C. I mean, fault. Trying to write to 100, which looks valid ish. It's in the ballpark of valid. It's the second time I'm executing this. Oh, okay. It is. Thank you. Um, so, what does this do? We know that. We're getting, so at 8A, this has 8B, or OO. Oh my god, reading this is so painful. 9A, so it has 009A. And what does this do? This increments Y by 1. Y is 0. Increment Y by 1. So that should come around. We should see it, uh, 3C executes, 3E, 3F, go to 3.7, go to 3.8, 3A, 3C. Um, let's, uh, let's read the, um, wherever that we put our assembler, CC65, um, oops. And if I search for search for uh we'll have to RG it. What? Um there's the Atari. CRT zero. Oh, we, we brought that up on the website is what we did. Uh, CRT zero Atari CC 64. See, uh, GitHub CRT zero S that's for the NES lib source Atari 2600 CRT. Okay, that's calling clear loop. Okay, and then we could call copy data. I'm guessing that um, this is because it, it's probably actually working. I probably need to actually map in that memory. Potentially, potentially. <laughs> uh, where's copy data? Here's our copy data. Copy data. Okay, common. Oh, that's geos. Uh, okay, so the source pointer, data pointer, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So this is just doing a copy, and it's doing a copy from source to target of a size.
Okay, so if we look at this, um, we should see that we are doing a copy from uh, we're doing a copy from FO4C into 09A. And we're copying how many bytes? We're doing a copy of those, and then the data size, LDX and LDA. We're copying FF. Now, I don't know why that's happening on the second iteration. Oh, is that the... I don't know if that's the end. I'm guessing that's the end. It's probably going to use uh, LDX, LDA, store A90, temp1, uh, increment temp1, bump the high counter byte. Like that, that looks like it's doing a copy of FFFF. Now, that being said, I don't know why we're seeing 100 already. Because it should be writing. Let's put a breakpoint again on this. Take a look. Take a little look. See. Um, jit. If PC is equal to this, I think I need to deref it. As I'm done in three. I'm going to turn on the oven quick. I'll be right back. All right, let's figure this one out. Okay, so this is the first time that we're at this instruction. And X10 IPC. Um, so ZMM20 tw should have the address that we want to access. Uh, and we're going to do like a double access. So in this case, here we see and then a zero extension. Okay, so this is going to, this is going to DRF 8A. So let's do, uh, we expect that on our first iteration, 8A at address 8a, there should be a 009a. 009a. 
right? So if I do a step, OK. Uh, display IPC. We're going to do a step, step. Whoa. Oh, uh, go up. Oh no, that's 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 the wrong one. Uh, how do you go up from a function? In fact, I'm just gonna put a breakpoint here. Uh, break. Uh, continue. Okay. So now we have zmm six is what it loaded. So x10i pc or x10i ir of zmm six. So this is what it loaded. Looks good. It is a it loaded a 9a which is good. So now I can do next instruction that will uh that will perform a what's that going to do? That's going to make a uh zero extension. Okay, so if we take a look at zmm 6 or ZMM20, sorry. ZMM20 is 9A, good. And then we're gonna do a next instruction. Okay, we do a, an access this time at IR ZMM4. And it's at 8B. So we, we read at 8A, and now we're gonna read 8B. And we expect it to be a zero. Next instruction. Okay, so it has read that. It's then going to, uh, so we can take a look at IR ZMM6. It's a zero, looks good. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna shift it to the left by eight. We're then gonna OR it with 20. We're gonna shift it left. Uh, so that's gonna 16 bit zero extend it. We're gonna add this with the current ZMM22, which is going to be the Y register. IR ZMM22 is zero. We're gonna zero, uh, 16 bit zero extend that. And now we have our final address, which is where we're gonna perform our write. Um, and we're gonna write a value at the address ZMM4. So IR ZMM4. So we're going to write to address 9a, which is good. So we, we were able to translate that. We got the address, looks good. And the value that we're going to write there is going to be an ff. So we're going to write an ff to 9a. OK. Store a. In this case, A is a, uh, what's A? Load A, it came from 88. Um, and 88, that should be from uh, FO4C. And if we look at FO4C, it's an FF. Okay, so we are correctly writing an FF to that location. So what's the issue? Um, Oops, uh, oh boy, uh, x 10 pc or x 10 this. We'll put a breakpoint on the next instruction, so, or here, x 10 this. This is gonna be the next instruction, this uh, 503e. Uh, put a breakpoint here, continue, hit our breakpoint. We're at FO3E, looks good. Here we want to increment the Y register. And uh, that's just updating our, our buffer. So we're going to add ZMM22 in place, which is zero. And we're going to add a hopefully one. Yep. So we're going to add one to that. 
branch not equal. Then are we going to increment the 89 and 8b pointers? Maybe this is where it's failing. Because that looks good. So step instruction. Then we, we zero extend it. Everything's good. We perform our compare. And what path do we take? We end up at 3f. Or oh, this is the. Oh, that was flag calculation. Now we're doing a branch. Jump not equal. Uh, now we get to R15. Uh, move racks R15. That's updating the instruction count. F037. So that looped up to here. So that shouldn't have affected the memory at 8. Um, I guess store A. So we load the A from there. This is just mem copy. Um, increment Y. So we're incrementing our index. And this is basically, this is, uh, this is incrementing on the low byte. And then this is incrementing on the high byte. Um, so we're going to read from this. I and X, increment X. Okay, no problem. Um, so this should be IR ZMM26. X should be zero. We're going to add a one to it. And X started out as FF. So yeah, so now X is going to be one. Then we're going to update flags. Now we're at FO38. This is going to check if we do our, uh, our branch in which case we are not doing our branch. Uh, we're at FO3A. We're gonna perform the load. Well, that's gonna, this is gonna get the, um, that's doing the 88 DREF, so let's take a look at ZMM6. That got a zero. And 88 should have a, wait, that should have a 4C. That should have a 4C, shouldn't it? 88. Store a 4C. How is that getting zeroed? Shift left logical quadrant. Okay. Um. What's this access? This is reading eighty nine. Uh, I wish I could, I wish I could rewind, <laughs> really wish I could rewind right now. Um, for some reason, I don't know if that requested 88, it, it should have, uh, this is requesting 89 and what's 89? IR ZMM6, and that's F0, which is correct. But how did this become zero? How did 88 become zero? Um, X and XG R9, we're gonna do a, a quick walk of this page table. X, XG of this, X10, XG of this, XG of this. XG of this, 
Get rid of that. Okay, and then we're gonna add uh, OX 80 times OX 88 over eight. 16G. Okay, so this should be the contents of memory. We had a 4C, an FO4C, which is what we expect. Why did the first one return? Did I print the wrong register? Um, XIPC. How did that continue? Wait, I didn't give it a continue command? Did I? Um, call that. Now we're here. We're at 49D. Okay. And then I looked at PC. And then I looked at ZMEM6. And for some reason, it was zeroed. Even though the contents there is a 4C. Oh no. What is the value? It's ZMM22. ZMM22 is. Uh, ZMM22 is still preserved. No, it's not. CMM twenty two. Okay, maybe we do have a register allocation issue. I'm really confused. Okay, so we're really interested in the FO three A on the second go. So let's take a look. We'll run our program. Now we are going to uh, x10 i pc minus 10, x64 i pc minus 100. Um, and we're going to look for, uh, OK, 126. Our alignment is off. I wish you could disassemble backwards in GDB. Maybe there is a way and I just don't know. Um, move abs, that, okay, uh, uh, 160. Like, is there a way to disassemble backwards in GDB? Because it's really annoying when you can't. Um, there's the 3C. Prior to the 3C, here we see this stuff going on. I'm guessing this is what we want. X10, uh, oops, X10 I, this minus 10, 30, 60, 80. Okay, there's F of 3A, B, uh, break on this. Continue, X and I, PC. Okay, so we're about to start this instruction. And this instruction, uh, IR ZMM22 is a zero. Why is that gonna DRF zero? Oh no. Is that a register allocation issue? Oh no. Oh no. That's gonna be a pain in the ass to debug. I gotta throw some something in them. Be right back.
Okay, let's take a look at uh, FO3A. So we do have like an interesting loop here and I could see that totally breaking my register allocation. So here, I want a DRF ILR 60 and it should be 88. Yeah, for some reason. Um, for some reason, register allocation has given that back up. That's brutal. That's brutal. Um, yeah, we're looping to FO3A, and somehow it is like ILR60 needs to stay alive basically forever now. And ILR60 is alive here. Yep. And it's the 88. And down here we go to deref it. And in this case, we see that ZMM22 in this case is, it's actually writing over it. It's writing over ZMM22 and then it's using it for other allocations. Oh, that's really bad. It's like, it does not think it needs to keep ZMM22 around. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Well, that's not good. That's obviously just going to get clobbered. Oh, no. I knew we were going to hit this. I'm not too surprised. Register allocation is incredibly hard. Especially graph-based register allocation. So, for some reason, our register allocation... Let's double check, make sure we're not doing something stupid. ILR60... Um, does it not see that it can loop back up to itself? That might be the issue. Okay, here we have the allocations going through, lifetimes, allocation states, walk the graph. Well, we have notes to process, check, process it. Uh... Okay, look up the allocations for this block. Allocations starts out current allocations for a given block. Starts out as zero. Uh, label zero has everything free. And then we walk the graph. We look up the allocations for the block. Um, if we don't have active allocations for this block, then we inherit the ones from the dominator. So we get the dominator for the current node. So in this case, we'd get uh, this blocks. Um, would this be the dominator for this? Yes. Yeah, this would be a dominator for this. Um, clone the allocation mapping from the immediate dominator. Looks good. Put that in the node. Get access to the allocation state for this node. Then we're going to go through all of these things. Compute the allocation. Save the current allocation state. Go through active allocation. Look, looking for ones which are no longer needed. Okay. So, um, see if the lifetime at this location. Okay. So, we'll do a print. Um, uh, let's see if I can do ILR60 directly. If ILREG is equal to ILREG60, print, uh, we can free ILR60 at location. Okay, let's see. Let's see if that prints through.
Okay. Um. We gotta make sure we're on the right graph too. So let's get this graph updated. Uh, dump dot an aisle session, and we'll run it locally. Let's see what happens. Okay, so that has been renamed. That's now ILR66. It's down here. Looks good. Okay, so ILR66. Uh, Okay, this is saying at 24.1, it's no longer used. So that's wrong. It also says at 28.0, it's no longer used. Uh, oh, that's 28.0 here. Yeah, it's no longer used after this point. That makes sense. So for some reason, this traversal is failing. But we do have a path here, which is uh, we exit out. So we can either loop back around into 24. OK. So for some reason, we don't see that we're using ILR66 again. Um, lifetimes is coming from the lifetimes function. Uh, general lifetimes for all ILR registers for each instruction in the graph. Um, so we traverse the graph. We go through each block, go through each instruction, go through each aisle register created. So we know where every aisle register is created. Let's make sure that we log that correctly. Alreg outputs anything that marks an out. Okay, reg read, reg write, mem read, div mods, zero extension, has an output, sign extension, set condition. Uh, branch conditional, all inputs. All of these have outputs. These have outputs. Reg read, immediate. Uh, reg rate doesn't. Okay. Trap, div mod, mem write, zero extend, sign extend, condition, branch condition, branch indirect, and nop. Okay. So that should be fine. So this will go through and uh, show where each, the location of each creation. Then we're going to go through everything in the graph. Is this created in blocks here by any chance? No, it's not. Then we're going to do reachable. We're going to do a traverse BFS, and we're not going to include ourselves in a loop. Oh, is this wrong? Look up all reachable blocks, excluding itself, unless it can be reached itself via a loop. Um, I think for some reason, it can't find itself. Go through each instruction, uh, get a used map, go through each remaining in the current block. Oh, so in this block, we want to go through the remaining in this block not including our current instruction. Is that the issue? Is this used anywhere else? No. Um, well, that's fine. Then, so if it's used at any point further in the block, then we need to keep it. Uh, we set it to used. Uh, for our rig in the inputs, OK. Let's make sure we have the ins implemented correctly as well. Oops, not this side. So all the in parameters. Okay, we have aisle regs. Sign extend, zero extend. Correctly marking those as inputs. 
Correct. 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 Okay. So. So we go through. We go through all of the remaining instructions. So we go through every instruction in this block. Wait, why is this in here? Um, go through every reachable instruction in this block. Create a mapping of used. Go through everything in the... I don't know what this outer loop is, in fact. Oh, we're creating the use mappings for each. Okay, so we compute what's reachable from our block. And then we go through the remaining instructions in the block. And if that is used, if uh, we track which input registers are used, then we go through each reachable block. And we go through every instruction in the reachable blocks if the input reg is in here, if the IL reg created this is not equal to, uh, check if the IL register is created in the block it is used in. Um, if it's created in the block it's used in, then we don't have, okay, so if IL reg created is in there, okay then lifetimes insert used uh, for label inst ID. Okay, um, this should be correct. I don't know if maybe our traversal is not finding uh, block 24 again. So let's see uh, if label is equal to, here we'll just say this, if label is equal to block, uh, I'll label 24, print reachable from 24, this reachable. It's going to be simple. It's going to be simple. Uh, from 24, we can reach 22, uh, 32, 25, and 28. Oh, shit. Okay, so 24, we can reach 32. Yeah. We can reach 22 and 25. Yep. So, okay, so from 22, where can we go? So 22, we can go to 24 or 25. Uh, we have 25, which is good. From 32, 22, 25, 24, 25. Why is 24 not in there? Um, traverse BFS internal. Oops. Um, Falk IL source IL graph traverse. Traverse BFS internal. And if include from is set to false, then from is only included in the input vector if it's accessible via a loop. And what's happening here is it's for some reason not being included. So let's see. Um, ooh, visited. Is that the issue? Q pushback from if we have not already visited this node. If include from or it's not the first iteration, this I think needs to be here. Um, two sources of the same aisle reg. Okay. Um. So that's not 100% correct. Um, if visited insert node, uh, and here I wanna say if not include from and the node is equal to uh, from. This means we didn't include the from. If include from, okay, then we push this into the node. 
into the traverse list. Okay, so now reachable from 24, 22, 32, 24, 25, 24 again. Um, I guess I could make this a set visited. The problem is that's a vector. I'm trying to like omit that. Uh, I need to rethink this logic. I mean, this is fine. Obviously, it's just it has a repeat. Um, so if if we've already visited the node, then we can continue, which will happen in the very first case. Um, If we want to include our from, the problem is basically uh, the from node will never get included in the graph. So uh, if include from or, so if we want to always include from or we're not in the first iteration, then we always push that we traverse to this node. Otherwise, we set the f uh, first to false, um, which is fine. In fact, I don't I don't even want to have that in an else. We're just going to do first equals false after that point. That doesn't really affect anything. Um, okay. So now we can free ILR60 at 28. So that's the only location where we can free that. Um, so at 28, zero. Okay. Yep. So this is saying at this point, there's no way to use that ILR again. I need to get rid of this repetition. I could make this a set internally. Traverse hash set. And then I can do this. Traverse, and then I can do traverse dot into. I don't know if into is implemented. Probably not. Um, dot iter dot collect. It's kind of gross. Um, dot moved or copied. I can come back to that if it's a perf issue, but this should now be correct. If not include from, and that is that. Can I move this up now? Traverse insert node. I think I can. I think I can do this now. So if include from, or it's not the first iteration with into iter, you don't need to copy it. Oh, I see. Ah, uh, I see. I never use into iter, but thank you. Okay, so now if we always want to include from, or we're not on the first iteration, then we always insert the node. And that means if we loop back to that node, that will be included. Okay. So now we can change reachable from there. Okay. And uh, in our JIT in three here. Okay. Deploy. Okay. Filter and dot, perfect. Uh, that one I can deal with. <laughs> that one I can deal with. Not many, but that one. All right.
Oh. FO3C. Okay. And this one... This one might be... It looks like we did iter the correct amount of times that now we're we're writing over FF. I might need to set data size. I don't think this would actually run on a normal Commodore. Um or on a normal Atari. If we take a look at this, this is going to uh This is going to store A at 90 of FF. So it's going to copy FF bytes. And there are not FF bytes available on the Atari. So this is just inherently going to go out of bounds. Right? Because it's going to it's going to copy FF bytes uh, from FO88 to... Um, It's actually going to copy more than that, isn't it? So, i and y, branch not equal. So, if it's not equal to zero, and this is uh, i and y, if it's not equal to zero, okay, and then here, this is the upper counter. Yeah, I think this ends up doing, like, a massive copy. How's Rust on Windows? Perfect. No issues. It's about the same as, as Linux. Okay, if we do... Yeah, I'm pretty sure that this is going to loop until y is not equal to zero. Uh, oh, here we go, i and x. So x is going to be our loop counter, I think. Oh, I gotta grab some food out of the oven. Okay, but that looks about right. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this just always goes out of bounds on the Atari. Um, which isn't really an issue because the, like, RAM loops on the Atari. Uh, but, yeah, this definitely looks wrong. Uh, LDX, INX, branch of equal. So if it's, if it's zero... Then we're going to branch to here, which is this. And then it's going to ink the address at 90, which it's stored in FF. This is actually copying 64K? Really? 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 Question mark, really? Let's take a look at uh, uh, soft serve. Okay. 6502 test. And what is that supposed to be doing? So it copies data size, under, under data size. So from data load to data run, it copies data size bytes. And data size... Data size. I really wish I like knew what this value is. Maybe I can, uh, maybe I can return an int through my application and compile it. Let's do that. Um, so if we look at main, so this is the main function of our application. It loads uh, uh, zero into x. 
So let's uh, modify that application quick, our test app. Uh, CD this. Even test.c, return under under data under size under under. Was that what it was? Data size? What was it called? CRT zero, RAM start, RAM size. Oh, it imports these and it's going to If it's importing those things, maybe I have to actually define those. Um, CC65 Atari 2600. Let's see if I can like find a quick guide. Uh, what's my GitHub? It is this. Okay. Uh, CC65. Uh, okay. Attempting to code C on the Atari. Atari 2600, hello. That's kind of cool. Um, Atari 2600, hello. Okay. Uh, hello. I want to see if these, like, Atari 2600, hello. Yep, all the scan line stuff. Memory zones. Data V, BSS V. Maybe I need to set those up. Unfortunately, it's just kind of out of our control. Is because it's copying FFFF bytes. And if we look at this, this is supposed to be um, copy data. Uh, copy data, common. And in this case, copy data takes the data size. And it's like the high and the low bytes. And effectively, the issue is our data size is set to 64K. Um, that imports data size. How do, how do I control that? Um, there has to be a way that I can set this. SGML, what's this? No. Um, Segments, data size, data size. Um, data size. Oh, do I have to just make a word for it? No. Import data size. Where's data size coming from? Data, define. Data, load RAM low. And this is 4,000 minus S. File that. Okay, let's take a look at our config file for the Atari. Dev CC65 Atari. Um, guessing this is the trick, this config here, uh, RAM, ROM, 
uh, data, RO data optional, okay, run in RAM, define yes. Do I, do I set it here? Let's see, let's first make sure that that has an effect on our linker. Okay, attribute expected, cool. So data size, I feel like this is probably not right. Um, oh, 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 it's probably not right. Hex digit expected. Value. Okay. Uh, semi. Type weak. Okay, whatever. Um, I don't know if that actually affected anything. There's a good chance it didn't. I I'm going to hazard it probably didn't. So we're going to load this for uh, 6502. Yes. Uh, loading at foo, good, function, graph, missing ending under under, oh yeah it is, I don't even know if this is where it comes from though, it's probably, um, it probably comes from, oh duplicate external, okay, yeah, nice, so this means data, uh, optional define. Okay, so what if I do that? Uh, data load. Okay, unresolved external type RW load ROM run RAM type RW optional yes. I might be able to do this. Maybe if I say like data. Foo size zero. Fill. Okay. What if I did this? Oh, I, I built. <laughs> Six five zero two set. Okay. This f. This f. This p. Go into that function. F, 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 F. Okay, why? Why, why, why? Define yes. Run RAM. Optional yes. Load equals data. Hmm. Load RAM. Maybe that's what I want to do. Load RAM, run RAM. RAM, RAM. Okay. So that means it shouldn't really have to do anything clean all. Okay, good. Let's see what happens here. I don't even know if I copied that last binary in. I think I did. Yeah. Probably did. Oops. Oops. Don't save. 6502 set this. Foo. Foo. This P. This FFFF. Come on. Come on. Load from RAM. Run in RAM. If I do define no, this doesn't build, right? Okay. Well, you know what? You know what? Fuck all your stuff. Vector's there. Okay, good. Nice. Okay. <laughs> Data load. Uh, let's see, does this handle zero if if INX? Oh, is that right? 
LDX. INX, if it's zero, then we go to four seven, and then we ink ninety. Oh, this should work. And if it's not equal, then it goes around. Otherwise, it's zero. I think, I think what we currently have should work. Um, like whatever the most recent one we made. So, I feel like the original had FFFF. It's actually doing a copy of zero bytes. Now that I look at it, I think it should be doing a copy of zero bytes. So let's see if I'm correct here. Uh, P, JSR. Okay, yeah, because it loads FF into X and then stores this high byte into A. Load Y, we increment X. If it's zero, so FF plus one is zero. If it's zero, we go here and then we increment 90. And if that's zero, then we return. So like this. Um, let's see if our INX is correct. INX in here. Uh, here we update zero and that. Oh, shit. These flags are not correct. Um, they don't zero extend. Okay, uh, let's... Oh, it's fine. We found, we found a... Luckily, due to this bug, we actually found a bug in our stuff. So, yeah. So, this file is fine, as is. Okay, no surprise. Now, um, so on these update zeros... The value, so in the case of like that i and x, right, uh, we actually add one. We write it out correctly uh, because we zero extend there, but we don't zero extend in our um, computation of these. So what we're going to do is let um, uh, val is going to be equal to graph.sign extend val by uh, alward8 or zero extend. So we're going to zero extend that. And then for update negative, we're gonna do the same thing here. Val is equal to that, where we're going to zero extend the value. Okay, we fixed it. Done. 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 Okay, so what happened is that executed until we got to uh, B, 40B. Uh, cool, then we returned back, and on our return, that got a fook. So that wanted to execute at fook, which is correct. Um, that's the return address. Then we started lifting all of this stuff at, at fook. Um, so it lifted, let's turn some of these options on. Okay. So it lifted an LDA. It lifted an LDX. It lifted a store to a zero page. Lifted another store X zero page. And then we have a JSR absolute um, into here. This is main. We then load our LDX, LDA. We re-enter that VM. We execute fook E 10, 12, 14, 1A, 1C, 1E. And then we exited with a uh, 1, 7. Requesting lifting, and I think we're just stuck. Uh, oh, that exited due to a Y. Uh, is this an infinite recursion? Yeah. Um, is it? Is it? Shouldn't be. I I'm guessing that this is crashing doing due to infinite recursion, or or I put a breakpoint somewhere. Um, I potentially put a breakpoint somewhere where I like wanted it to exit, and I uh, forgot that breakpoint. Um, sig sev x10 ipc um, x10 xg rbx. Oh yeah, um, this is crashing because we have it in trace mode. So we're gonna turn off the tracing stuff. Um, so in our JIT, we're gonna turn this to false. 
And then we're gonna go up to here and we're gonna set this to false. Okay, so it was running out of it was running out of room in the uh, trace buffer because it was looping infinitely at the end. So this we shouldn't see any fuzz cases. Um, yep, because it it gets stuck. So then what I could do is I could cause a crash. So in my application, I could have this like um, u in or like int. Uh, I'll I'll just like yeah int pointer. We'll deref like uh, five, uh, ox, one three. Th we'll deref leet, and we'll store leet into it. There you go. Uh, we probably should build it. Okay. Here we go. Okay, and these are all exiting with that. So let's do uh, print. VM exit, we don't need that. Uh, don't need that. Um, don't need that. And then if trace buff, which there isn't. Okay, so we're seeing that we see an MMU fault of an access of a write of one byte at leap. There we go. So we we are now running 6502 code in uh, in our vectorized emulator. How nifty is that? Okay. Well, that's pretty cool. Two hundred fifty thousand fuzz cases a second. Obviously, we're not doing anything. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously, we had a bunch of bug fixes. This JIT didn't start working until two days ago, so I'm actually really happy with this. Um, and now we can just spin up threads <laughs> you know the solution to all your problems is always threads and uh that's really cool it'll take longer to spin up when we have threads no surprise it's spinning up 2000 vms okay Where are my prints at? It actually seems like much slower to launch, and I'm I'm not. Uh, it's maybe making some like memory copies. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know what is causing that. Reset. So when we did single threaded. Okay, we're getting 250,000 a second. Let's go to eight. Okay, so something is not scaling in it for some reason. Let's try, uh, let's try 64 threads. Okay. Yeah, something's not scaling. Um, what could that be? Oh, uh, are we like, we, we probably have like some debug stuff. Um, Uh, populate and oh yeah 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 we have a lock we d we didn't implement branches correctly yet, um, yeah our branches are our our branches are not handled inside the IL which causes us to exit and uh, I think acquire like a global lock every iteration so that just needs to be changed but. I'm going to call the stream there. I'm really happy with this. Uh, we're able to just 
execute 6502 instructions now. We, we haven't implemented all of the 6502 instructions, but we have implemented all the ones we've seen so far. My confidence is pretty high that we're correct on all of them as well. Um, so I'm going to wrap up the stream here. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. See you around another time.